Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Metropolitan Governance Task Force meeting for this uh, Wednesday, January 17th, and uh, glad to see uh, so many people here today. Uh, joining us online, uh, we have um, Renee, uh, Ms. Renee uh, Pereira-Webb, uh, Senator Lindsay Port, Mary Paddock, uh, Mr. Uh, Reed, and uh, Senator Coleman. Um, so welcome, everybody, and um, appreciate, again, the uh, flexibility that people had in uh, getting here a little earlier because we have a, a fairly involved agenda. Um, just before we get to the minutes, I just on a, no a personal note wanted to thank um, uh, everybody for um, these very thoughtful proposals that we received. Uh, and um, please note that um, Senator Pratt has one um, that's being distributed, and I believe Mr. Rockwell uh, has uh, some thoughts as well. Um, and just in starting, I wanted to, um, uh, in addition to expressing appreciation, um, really in, in reading these, I, I was able to see that so many of you had really uh, listened to one another, listened to uh, the testimony uh, from, you know, other, uh, you know, uh, other uh, regions um, and had really incorporated um, so much of what you had heard here over these last few months into your ideas. And uh, I think that's helpful because um, I saw, you know, people, many people came in with some preconceived notions and I saw some movement here, uh, you know, as a result of our deliberations. And I found that very, very encouraging. And just before we start, I um, want to express that note of appreciation. So uh, our next item of uh, business is adoption of the previous minutes meetings. Uh, Representative Weens. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I move the adoption of our minutes from January 10th of the Metro Governance Task Force. Um, is there discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, the motion prevails. Uh, our next item of business is um, continuation of a, uh, a discussion we had last week. Um, uh, Ms. Paddock had uh, brought to us a uh, problem uh, statement, uh, if you will, and um, uh, I thought it was important that we, we start with this. There was some... Um, uh, interest in this last week, but uh, I, uh, some suggestions were made by other members uh, to Ms. Paddock to, uh, on some language changes. Uh, so I believe that she's incorporated those. And um, I think it's good to start with this uh, before we get into the discussion of recommendations. So with that, um, Ms. Paddock, uh, did you want to explain your motion? Well, move your motion and explain it. and. Uh, and then we'll have a uh, task force discussion. Oh, uh, Ms. Paddock, I think you're muted. If you could unmute. Thank you, thank you, Mr. There Chair. You Is there a chance you could put it up on the screen? Yeah, we're, we're working on that right now. Okay, so um, I offered this motion, which I would call the diagnostic motion because I think before we come up with any solutions to what the legis to the to the issue that the legislature has proposed to us, we do need to define and agree on what problem we are solving. Because if we don't know what problem we're solving, then any solution is as good as the next one, right? So, um, so, so my proposal um, echoes what I think we've heard in very loud voices from, from the public, but also within our uh, own task force. And I saw that even the city of Minneapolis weighed in um, this week with their um, missive to us saying that accountability is a problem. So just to read it out loud, um, I would propose this as a, a kind of format, a finding and then a recommendation. We have determined that there is widespread confusion and widespread disagreement about who is and who should be accountable to the Met Council. Um, 
uh, for vision, planning, and execution, that is construction and operation, as well as performance evaluation. So the recommendation would be that the first and core issue the legislature should address in any Metropolitan Council reform or governance changes is how the council should be accountable to the public and to the local governments, so both. We recommend that the legislature make clear assignment of these areas of accountability. And I so move. Okay, so we have a motion that's been moved. Uh, we, uh, we don't, uh, the custom and usage in the legislature is that we, we don't have seconds. Uh, so we have this now uh, before us and um, I would entertain uh, discussion to the motion and we'll take a vote, a roll call vote on it um, at the appropriate time. So members, uh, including those online, if you want to be recognized, uh, let me know. Okay, uh, Chair Cleborn. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Paddock, for your work and thoughtful consideration. Um, my question about this is, as we are, I do believe there is confusion, even amongst the task force, and I'm wondering, um, when we are talking about this issue of governance, right? Is it confusion in the governance accountability or is it confusion in the operational processes of Met Council governance or Met Council uh, activities? Because what I heard a great deal about, um, and, and I just wanna say to Ms. Paddock, every time she speaks, I wanna say to her, I hear you and I understand the disruption of her community. I just wanna say that out loud in public. But um, if we're talking about governance, uh, that's one topic for accountability, and I believe the statutes are clear on governance as to who they're accountable to and for what. If we're talking about process, Clearly, in process, there are places where improvement can be made. Um, and it, for Ms. Paddock, you know, to, uh, I want to say I clearly believe there should be some sort of appeal process. Her community never felt like they had a voice in what was happening, so there was no appeal process. But we're talking about governance of a very large organization, and we've really only heard complaints in two basic areas. So it is working well in many sectors of Met Council. So I'm wondering, um, does this accountability piece really have to do with governance or does it have to do with process? Thank you. It's a good question and you're directing a, a question to Ms. Uh, to in conversation for okay, anybody else who would have a comment. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's not necessarily directed to the author, but to, to no, 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 no. Ms. Paddock has been very thoughtful, yeah. and I appreciate the fact that she has broadened the problem. Okay, so uh, the discussion to um, the motion and, and anyone who wants to respond to um, uh, Chair Cleavorn's, um, I think, question really about process versus governance. Anyone? Okay. Well, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, uh, Senator Pratt. Well, I think I think Representative Cleveland brings up a you know an interesting interesting uh, comment because as you know as I worked on this a number of years ago, I went through the history of the Met Council and and you know looking at staggered terms um, of Met Council reps and I believe back in 1994. Uh, or 93, they were made coterminous so that they were at least accountable to the governor because at the time, there was a belief that the Met Council wasn't accountable to anyone. And what I've heard, and I think how I'm interpreting the word accountable is who are they responsible to, who are they, for lack of a better, I, I don't like this term, but I can't think of another one, so please forgive me if it's, but who do they answer to? Um, you know, do they answer to the residents? Do they answer to the cities and counties? Do they answer to the governor? Um, I think you and, and others have made a, you know, a, a pretty 
good argument that there is some independence between the governor and and the Metropolitan Council, even though it is a you know at least acting like a state agency, and I think that's probably part of why the perception is there that the governor has more influence and control over the day-to-day -day operations than they than he really does. Um, and so I think that's the I think that's the perception. I think that's the the situation that we find ourselves in, and how I read the word accountable. Um, and I'd love to know, you know, I'd love to know what Ms. Beckman thinks. I'd like to know what, you know, what others think about that perception. Okay, thank you for your comment. And um, and if anyone else wants to weigh in, uh, we can we can hear that. And no one is obligated to uh, to respond to anything that's been said. But I do uh, recognize uh, Ms. Beckman since she was. Uh, I think uh, my comment would be I'd, I'd look to Mary or Ms. Paddock for further clarification on the request about uh, clear assignment of accountability to the public and local governments. Because in my understanding, the council has a level of accountability to the state legislature through the committee structure that exists. And they have to review their budget and their operating plans. And so the Senate really has oversight. And so when I read this uh, resolution, it is adding a level of oversight for counties and cities and townships. And so I guess I'd put it back to Ms. Paddock of, are you asking for additional oversight from what the legislature does now between the committee that reviews things and the Senate that confirms council members and you want an additional layer of accountability with cities and counties and townships? So we had a, a question from Senator Pratt that was uh, uh, directed to Ms. Beckman and she's made a uh, response to that but then also has an, a question for the author of the resolution, Ms. Paddock. Uh, Ms. Paddock, were you able to hear the question clearly? Yes, yes, I could. And thank you, uh, Ms. Beckman. Um, I, think, I think this discussion itself shows that there is confusion about who the Met Council is responsible to. We, the, the public, I mean, we, yes, to the governor, but to all, for all intents and purposes, the governor seems to have a very hands-off attitude. The only time I remember the governor really stepping into a Met Council uh, decision in a clear way is, is uh, Governor Dayton when he decided to go ahead with the project when it reached $2 billion. That's the only time I've seen any government, any uh, gubernatorial involvement. And, and people are wondering, is this hands off? Have all governors been hands off? Are they behind the scenes uh, telling people what to do? There's, the members are supposed to be um, kind of pledge allegiance to the governor's agenda. Um, what is the meaning of having representatives from districts that don't really have any um, legitimate connection to the district other than that they live there, what is the role of the, the county or the municipality? Um, people don't know what um, municipal consent really is. There have been inconclusive discussions about that. There's all kinds of questions about accountability. And in my motion, um, I, I am perfectly willing to amend it if it suggests that we solve this issue in any particular way. All I'm trying to do is to say that the legislature, I'm trying to reiterate that the legislature has identified a problem. The public, the, they've delegated us to find out what it is and make recommendations for it. If we didn't hear loud and clear from the eight hours of public testimony that they have a problem with accountability, then we're really not listening. And I think somehow, in order to be responsible to the, to the public who 
were consistent in their answer that they don't that they are upset somehow, confused, or they disagree about accountability. Then we have tin ears, and we're just not being responsible. So all I, uh, all I mean to say is there's a problem with accountability. Either the, the people don't, first of all, people say that there is. And secondly, we've had a lot of discussion about it in our own group. That's all I mean to say. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have two more uh, folks on the list, and then I think we'll uh, take a vote. Um, Professor Orfield, and then we'll have Chair Cleborn. I think this, this question uh, it goes to the, the structure of the Med Council, and we never really got a clear answer about what it was. But I think that it's a local government. I think their responses said that it was a local government. They, I really couldn't ask those questions because of uh, interruptions, but I think it's a local government. If it's a local government, it's constitutionally responsible to the people. And I think that that is, a, is, is an important thing, if it is a local government, which they seem to say it is. It also has a responsibility to the constituent go governments in, it, in, its, uh, in, its, in its purview. But I mean, I think that if it is a local government, and if it has that kind of discretion, it certainly has to be accountable to the citizens of the metro area. OK. Um, I think we had Chair Cleaver and I, and Representative Kosnick has been um, giving me, uh, making eye point. contact. I don't know if you wanted to be recognized. OK, so we'll hear from Chair Cleavorn and then uh, Representative Kosnick. You know, I kind of lost my train of thought once, uh, <laughs> once I heard that. Anyway, um, when I hear people say that our local representatives are not responsive or not engaged or have no connectivity to community. I just want to say that is not the experience that we have in the district represented by my, by my representative on the Met Council. My member of the Met Council for the community that I serve is highly engaged, very involved, and will meet with anyone at any time at any place. So I don't want um, the Met Council members, all of them collectively, to be thrown, quote, under the bus because someone may feel that their needs weren't met. Uh, my representative is awesome and highly responsive to both citizens, community, and <coughs> representatives. Representative Kosnick and then Senator Pratt. I'll pass. OK. Uh, Senator Pratt and then Commissioner Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would, you know, I would echo a lot of the thoughts for you know, who's representing Scott County. We have two, two, uh, two members representing Scott County. But to the thought of the oversight of the legislature by the, you know, of the Met Council, um, I don't know if it's as strong as I, I thought the discussion was, right? So we have the Metropolitan Governments Commission, which is um, a bicameral commission that comes together. And yes, we review the budget, but we really don't have any authority to make changes to that budget. Um, you know, when we discussed Calhoun Isles, um, we had to, you know, it was the first time the council, the, the commission had ever voted uh, on, a, on a recommendation and we couldn't tell them at council what to do. We could only recommend that they take these steps. And so it feels a little bit like a toothless lion when it comes to the Met Council and the legislature. Uh, certainly Chair Cleavorn and, and uh, Chair Murphy have the, uh, uh, probably a little more sway, but when it comes to, you know, when it comes to reviewing the budget, when it comes to some of the strategy, um, there's not a lot of interaction, there's not a lot of influence, there's not a lot of direction coming from the legislature. And so, that leads, I, you know, maybe among the legislators, uh, a, a desire to have maybe a little more more impact um, in what's going on. But certainly, the oversight that we do have lacks any true authority, and maybe that's something that we ought to be considering: is is to make that a more answerable, a more uh, direct. Uh, 
relationship. Um, Commissioner Green. I, I am going to amend my remarks and just let what the senator just said hang out there. We lack any true authority. We've heard that from our legislative body. Like, I couldn't say it better. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? Um, we'll have Chair Cleveborn and then uh, Ms. Beckman, and then I think we should wrap this up and get to some of the other agenda items we have. Chair Cleveborn. So when we say that the legislature lacks true authority, right, <laughs> then why are we sitting in this room right now? We're talking about a wholesale change of its structure. We're talking about a wholesale change of its uh, mission, a wholesale change of its whatever. You know, you can't say that we don't have authority and then and in the same breath say we're going to rewrite everything and change everything they do. I, I mean, that's like arguing both sides of a coin, right? So um, we do have that power. The piece that concerns me when it comes to the legislative oversight of Met Council is that, as you have said, uh, Chair Hornstein, is that all members of the legislature have a vote, right? So it's not just the, peop the representatives who represent the region of Met Council. It's the entire state that has oversight of Met Council. So um, I'm sure that people smarter than me years past thought about that and thought about how that could be done. And so there are some checks and balances in the system. But I, I think to say that we don't have oversight, then we can all go home right now and and be done. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Beckman, and then if there's no one else, I'll make a couple of concluding observations. No, I, I appreciate, uh, Chair Pratt, your sharing how I have assumed that that bicameral legislative body had more power and that you convened regularly, that you appointed members, that you pulled people in for hearings, that you rang out the budgets and the proposals and the policies and the, and the big pieces of this. And I, I wonder if it is by, function, by design or just by function. Is, does, the, is, does the committee have that power and it just hasn't used it? Or is it part of, like, as we think about legislative proposals, does the legislature need to give itself more power to have that review? Uh, it sounds like we have a question of uh, Senator Pratt so he can respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Beckman. And I think that's a, a, a really good question. Um, under the current model where the, the Met Council is, a, is in the governor's cabinet, I believe uh, we would have to give ourselves that power. Um, you know, whether it's a, a matter of function or, or a matter of structure, I, I believe it's a little of both. Um, but yeah, I do, you know, again, having, you know, having gone through it and realizing that we could only pass recommendations for the Met Council to consider was an eye-opening uh, experience for me when I was, now, you're right, we do, we do call meetings, we do bring in testifiers, we do, we do vet the budget, but again, it's not something that we change. It's not something that we have, um, you know, we, we, we listen to it. And, and like I say, the only time the, the, the commission, and this was something I had hoped would be a continual function in it, and it's kind of fallen off, is that the commission would take more votes and it would make more formal recommendations to the Met Council and, and maybe um, uh, strengthening that uh, would be a, an outcome that we should be we should consider. Uh, uh, okay, uh, point of clarification, and then we we need to move on to Representative Kosnick, Professor Orfield, myself. No, and then no I just want to make sure that oh. I understand what. Um, okay. So, Senator Pratt, you're talking about the Budget Commission, right? Are you talking about the budgetary review process? The budget, yeah, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Cleveland, the, the Metropolitan Governance Commission reviews the Met Council budget, but it, we also have met on 
other topics besides that. Okay, so here's here's the uh, the order here as we wrap up this discussion. Um, Representative Kosnick, Professor Orfield, Senator Dibble, and then I'll make a couple of concluding comments. Representative Kosnick. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Um, first, just to kind of clarify, what we're going to be voting on is this um, two paragraphs from Ms. Paddock to be included yeah. in the final report. Just is that yeah is that what we're saying? Um, okay, thank you. Uh, and, I might suggest that, you know, I don't, we probably don't, well, maybe we do need to wordsmith it some, um, but I, you know, I don't know if that's the, what you think that the task force will wordsmith the whole final report no, no, if you're no, going to no. do, but um, I guess from a legislative perspective, the recommendation that says the first and the core issue, um, maybe just take those out that, and it would read the legislature should address following the, the end of her statement. Um, just because knowing how the legislature works, I'm not certain we can guarantee what the first issue we bring up will be. Um, and certainly, I, I think this is a, an important issue of accountability in that, but um, there are other budgetary issues that might be, I, I don't know how, I just think it's a couple, couple extra words that uh, we can get tripped over and probably don't need. And then, so I'll put that out there as maybe a friendly uh, amendment. And just to the discussion on the Metropolitan Governance Commission, um, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, historically, in my little time here at the Capitol, uh, it has been underutilized. Uh, last year, the commission did not even meet. We did not approve uh, the budget of the Met Council, but I think that is something that um, maybe this task force uh, overlooked a little bit. Uh, we had some discussion among members of how to utilize that better uh, to provide more um, accountability, uh, but to be clear to the other members, that task, that commission uh, generally on, has only met about once a year. We failed to meet last year, um, but I think maybe a recommendation at the, at the legislative level is just make it a standing, um, well, I guess it actually is a standing commission, uh, oh, yeah. just like the pension commission stuff, but uh, it has failed in its responsibilities and that's on the fault of the legislature. And thanks, Representative Kozak, and I, I do agree with you that um, I think having some sort of, uh, I, I agree with you uh, that that is an important part of legislative sure oversight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you remember that meeting well. Um, but you know, members, I, th I think in, in response to the uh, a very, I think, legitimate uh, critique that you mentioned Representative Kozak, we will send um, around the statute to members of the committee that established this um, oversight commission, the Legislative Commission on Metropolitan Government, so people know it exists. We'll have that available to the public, and then maybe a short explanation of, you know, its, its role and function. So I think that's a, a, a legitimate point. Um, and then um, did you want to just... Uh, I mean, we could take a, this as a recommendation, um, the, the, your, your friendly amendment. Um, yeah, know, just to restate it, Mr. Paddock, Chair, if, would be take out uh, the words first and core issue. Um, okay, is there a discussion of that? And, um, you know, maybe we'll uh, just vote on this first and then we can get to the last um, couple of uh, comments. Mr. Chair? Yes. Oh, one second. One, one second. Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Paddock. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I would like to take out any extraneous words. I wonder if Representative Kosnick would cons take those words out and maybe just substitute the word basic, basic issue, because I believe that many of the issues that the peripheral issues that the public and others have brought out could be resolved if this one issue were addressed. So I see it as a foundational issue. Um, so if you're concerned about it being too verbose, would you consider just saying uh, the basic issue? We've, now we're really uh, uh, functioning as a legislative committee, which is great um, for the public to see. Um, Representative Kosnick. Uh, it's uh, Ms. Paddock's uh, 
statement, then that, that, fine with me. I mean, I, I recognize at the end that the legislature will do what the legislature will do, and we yeah. function a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the, you know, I appreciate her, uh, the point that I think I understand that her statement is, is to add some accountability and try to address that. Yeah. So whether it's the first and core issue or the basic issue, or just the legislature should address, uh, we'll, we get the point. Okay. I, I don't know if we need to vote on this, but I think that uh, uh, Ms. Olson, we, we could change the uh, recommendation to basic. Um, there's consensus on that. Okay. So that's what we'll vote on. Um, and then uh, thank you both, Representative Kosnick and uh, Ms. Paddock, for your um, uh, work on that. Um, we're going to go to Professor Orfield, Senator Dibble, and then we'll bring this to a vote because we have some very important uh, items coming up on the agenda. So, Professor Orfield, quickly. Yeah, yes, I just I think as a matter of law, the legislature can do anything it wants to the Med Council. It's yeah. plenary; it can rewrite all these yeah. things. I think what's happened with the Med Council, we don't know what kind of form of government it is, but it's acting like a really powerful special district. And special districts often get out of control. There's, a, there's lots of studies of this. There's a book, The Power Broker, about Robert Moses creating special districts that run accountable, that did things the public didn't want, that they were immune from public input. And these public districts became so powerful, they even controlled the committees of the legislature in New York in that case. Uh, you know, they reached into everything. They, they uh, decided to do everything. And I think the council's a little like that. And it's one of the reasons why uh, governments try to constrain the power of appointed special districts because they have a tendency to do things. They tend to have really powerful entities and they can become, because they spend so much money, they have lobbyists and they have the ability to influence policy because they can control the public bodies that they're influencing. And that's one of the dangers of an unelected body having this much power. Thank you. Um, Chair Dibble, uh, the last word, I'll also make one quick comment. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, I just want to say, I, you know, I was raised my hand when I wanted to rebut some, some other points that were being made. I will just uh, uh, refrain from doing so and just go back to the basic core or first in core or basic issue that's before us, yeah. uh, which is um, we're, we're voting on a finding and recommendation um, that at its foundation um, is the subject of the entire discussion the entire purpose of this task force and what we've heard uh, from numerous testifiers in the public testimony process as well as through the written record and that is um, th that it is very, very important for the Metropolitan Council uh, to be accountable. That's at the core and foundation of our democratic way of our democratic system. Um, some may believe that the accountability mechanisms are already in place. I think many uh, don't believe that is the case. Or if it is the case, it's very confusing, which mitigates against that uh, accountability that is so fundamental to self-governance in, in our form of democracy. Um, uh, I'm glad that the modifier basic has stayed in because I believe that accountability is the first position from which, and I said this in our last meeting, all the other things that have been discussed in this debate as well as has been discussed throughout the discussion of, of consideration of this whole matter. Um, and those are things like clarity. I think that gets to the process questions that were raised earlier, transparency, uh, collaboration, legitimacy, et cetera. I think that all flows from accountability, which is so basic to good governance and democratic values. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Dibble. And um, I wanted to just say thanks to everybody who um, uh, weighed in on this. Thank you to Ms. Paddock for bringing this forward. And um, I think that uh, it's important that we uh, look at a, a problem statement prior to the rich discussion, which I'm anticipating here in, in the next couple of hours. Um, so again, thanks to everybody, and um, the, I just wanted to say that the, um, the recommendation would, we will be striking first and core and substituting basic. Uh, so that is the, the motion before us, and it is custom and usage at the LCC that we take roll call votes, and so um, 
that is what we are voting on at the moment. So the role, um, I think Ms. Olson will, will take the role. Chair Hornstein. Aye. Senator Pratt. Yes. Ms. Beckman. Aye. Commissioner Bigham. Aye. Senator Coleman. Aye. Senator Dibble. Yes. Commissioner Green. Aye. Rep. Claiborne. Aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Professor Orfield. Aye. Ms. Paddock. Aye. Ms. Pereira Webb. Aye. Senator Port. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Rockwell. Aye. Rep Representative Weens. Aye. 16 yes. Okay. Thank you very much, members. Thank you, uh, Ms. Paddock. So um, we are now going to, uh, per our discussion um, from last week, we are uh, going to receive some proposals that members have. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Did we vote on the final, on oh. the final passage, or did we just vote on the on the? Oh, I was the, hoping the, it was. I the, thought we were talking. Okay. I had one more maybe possible oh. suggestion. Okay. For the motion. Uh, all right. Um, what's, what's to the amendment to make it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought that's the only piece okay. we were changing, and then we were going to vote on the proposal as a whole. Okay. Um, all right. I had said basic, uh, I, but that wasn't clear. So um, the the amendment is adopted. Uh, is there any other um, other uh, Mr. discussion? Chair. Further discussion. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know this this discussion, and and particularly around. Uh, uh, accountability and, and the role of the legislature kind of uh, got me thinking and I'd like to know what Ms. Paddock would think if we were to also make a change to who the Met Council will be accountable to so the the council should be accountable uh, to the legislature the public and local governments um, you know it seems like as we've talked about what the role of the legislature should be, the Met Council is a creature of the legislature. Um, we thought maybe the legislature and the Metropolitan Governance Commission had more uh, authority than, than the statute really provides for. Um, I think this is, a, this is an addition that we're missing one of the, the answerable bodies for lack of a better term, uh, that the Met Council should be um, should be accountable to, and and I'd like to offer that as a as hopefully a friendly amendment and get Ms. Paddock's thoughts on adding the legislature as one that it's accountable to. Um, uh, for the, there was a Ms. Paddock, did you was the, there was a question addressed to you, and then Chair Cleborn has a uh, wants to be recognized, uh, Ms. Paddock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pratt, if I understand what you're saying, you would amend um, the second part, recommendation, to say the core issue should address how the council should be accountable to the public, to state and local governments. Is that correct? Um. I would take that as a friendly amendment, if we're still in the business of amendments. <laughs> yeah, apparently we are. I would have. I would have. That's that's essentially the thought. I was I was going to add the legislature specifically as one of the accountabilities. So there would be, it would be the legislature, to the legislature, the public, and local go and to local governments. Ms. Paddock. Um. So there's also the governor to think about, which is why I might say state government, or we could say the legislature, the governor, public, and local governments. But we could just say the public and state and local governments. I'll take that. Okay. All right. That's, that works. Uh, Senator Pratt uh, has, is in agreement with that um, modification. Anyone else on this? Chair Cleborn? Thank you. I think until we understand what that process would look like, um, so would 
local government, I mean, I think I, I appreciate the, um, to be collaborative with local government, I would say, but we don't require, I mean, I looked up under um, statute 473.123, Metropolitan Council creation. It, um, we don't have any other local um, political subdivision that is accountable to another political subdivision. So I think it, that's a slippery slope I'm not sure I wanna go down. Um, so I, I just wonder exactly how that would look, what it would be like to say they're going to be accountable. I definitely believe they need to be collaborative with um, because we did hear from our townships and our um, exurbs that they don't feel that they, they are being listened to. I, wa I wanna acknowledge that, but to say accountable, I, I don't know what that would look like. Mr. Chair? Um, I'm, I heard of Mr. Chair, who, uh, that's Ms. Paddock, Ms. okay. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, the Med Council is already accountable to the governor. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask Senator Pratt for his comments and then we'll take a vote. Or, uh, Senator Dibble and then we'll take a vote. Senator Pratt? Uh, He's uh, taking notes here, so. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Chair, I was trying to look up that, that statute. You know, I think it goes to the idea of, of you know, who is the constituency of, of the Met Council, right? Um, clearly, uh, Professor Orfield and I have different views on on who that primary constituency is. Um, but I, as we've talked around the table, there's this belief that the legislature has had more influence over the operations, right? We had to approve their budget. Well, we can make recommendations, but we really don't approve or, or make any changes. Your committee may, you may direct them to do some things, at the vote of the entire legislature, but um, out of session, uh, you know, um, when we meet, it's it's the statute of the Metropolitan Governments Commission is is pretty limited to they may recommend, and maybe the and, and I think what I'm hearing is, and, and this isn't about setting, um, this isn't about writing a statute right now. This is just saying the legislature should address this issue and it's accountability to the legislature. And I just want to, or, and, and as Ms. Paddock amended it, to state government, right? Which would include the governor. So what's the relationship of the Met Council to the governor? What's the relationship of the Met Council to uh, the legislature? I think are things coming out of this report that should be addressed. Thank you. Um and then uh, we'll hear from Senator, Senator Dibble. Did you have your hand up? I, uh, and then we're, we'll restate the Pratt uh, amendment and then we'll vote on that and then we'll vote on the entire thing and move on. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Um, I think the Pratt amendment is, is fine. I think it, I, I'm not crazy about it, but um, I, I think it's fine because I think it's just a restatement of what is, what is actually true um, in that all political subdivisions of the state are accountable in some form or fashion uh, to the legislature and the governor because they are creatures of, of state law and subject to actions by the legislature. Um, and we can cite numerous instances where, where the legislature opts to, uh, to tell to boss county commissioners and counties around and with, uh, with requirements and you know, does or does not allow for local option sales taxes and things like that. So I think it just restates what, what is already uh, the case. I think it tends to drift us away from the core of what we're trying to, to accomplish uh, in this discussion of the task force, but I think it's, I think it's fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, do you uh, want to restate the, uh, your um, uh, change and then we'll vote on it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just going to start with uh, on line two where it says the council, the council should be accountable to the public, to 
and to state and local governments. Okay. Uh, this, I think we've had discussion, um, so I think we'll have um, Ms. Olson take the uh, role again. Chair, <coughs> Chair Hornstein. Aye. Senator Pratt. Is this on the amendment or the on motion? Your, on the, this, oh, to the Pratt. <laughs> the, we're going to call this the Pratt amendment or motion. I'll the vote Pratt for. Motion. I'll vote for my amendment. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Ms. Beckman? Yes. Commissioner Bigham? Aye. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Dibble? Aye. Commissioner Green? Aye. Representative Claiborne? Aye. Rep Co Representative Kosnick? Aye. Professor Orfield? Aye. Ms. Paddock? Aye. Ms. Pereira Webb? Aye. Senator Port? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Rockwell? Aye. Representative Weens. Aye. Okay. 16, yes, zero, no. So now, members, we have um, the Paddock um, motion uh, with the Kosnick and Pratt uh, suggestions uh, incorporated. Um, maybe if uh, Ms. Olson could just read it, or um, uh, we could have staff just read exactly what we're voting on. We'll take that vote, and then we'll move on. So uh, the problem, accountability, is the basic issue. Uh, finding, we have determined that there is widespread confusion and widespread disagreement about who is and who should be accountable for Met Council vision, planning, execution, construction and operation, and performance evaluation. Recommendation, the basic issue the legislature should address in any Metropolitan Council reform or governance changes is how the council should be accountable to the public and to state and local governments. We recommend that the legislature make clear assignment of these areas of accountability. Okay. Clerk will take the roll. Chair Hornstein. Aye. Senator Pratt. Aye. Ms. Beckman. Aye. Commissioner Bigham. Aye. Senator Coleman. Aye. Senator Dibble. Aye. Commissioner Green. Aye. Representative Claiborne. Aye. Representative Kosnick? Aye. Professor Orfield? Aye. Ms. Paddock? Aye. Ms. Pereira Webb? Aye. Senator Port? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Rockwell? Aye. Representative Weens? Aye. 16 yes, 0 no. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, members, I think, um, you know, Commissioner Green had wanted to discuss. Um, uh, principles that uh, were in her proposal. Um, and I don't know, is this a, for discussion purposes only, or did you want us to have a similar process that we just went through? I think conceivably we could have a similar process. OK. Yeah. Um, I am going to put a time limit on that, because we absolutely have to get to these uh, proposals. So um, if we can't come to some consensus in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, we'll defer action. But uh, if you have a a proposal on principles, uh, if you could just uh, explain those to the committee and then we'll uh, discuss and vote. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you committee members for the conversation that we're having and that we have been having over the last number of months. So uh, emboldened by the discussion that we all had the last time and the interest in what Ms. Paddock proposed, I had written up some proposed principles, which were uh, included in your packets on the back side of my proposed model, but they were intended as totally separate documents. And the reason I uh, very purposefully intended them as separate documents is because uh, as the proposals trickled in and as the conversation has gone on in this space, my sense is that there is a lot that we are aligned on <laughs> uh, and that it would be powerful for us to express our alignment on those principles even if we don't find ourselves aligned on the sort of nitty-gritty of how those principles are expe expressed in actual structures. Uh, and so I have copies if you'd like or it's on the back side of a document that I submitted but it's it says proposed principles and it lists four items. I'm happy to share these if anybody would like an extra set. Uh, um, sure. And yeah. Um, I, I will say this. Um, Commissioner Green, um, I think that a, a lot of the um, proposals that we have have some similar principles. Uh, Very much and, so. And that so was the idea. I just I think rather than going through all of these and then voting on them, 
Um, I think we should, I think you should incorporate them as part of your discussion. And uh, unless the, the committee feels otherwise, I, I think we just voted on a version of number three. So if we want to talk about representation and proportionality, self-determination and pay, um, you know, we can have that <coughs> discussion. But, um, you know, I, I guess that would be, um, I, I, I think that this is, I know that there are a number of um, proposals that have this incorporated. So um, if you want to quickly go through this and then we will leave this uh, at the behest of the task force in terms of how they want to proceed. But if you want to go ahead. Go. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate you highlighting that, yes, number three really was covered by the conversation we just had. I, and the, you commented that these are reflected in a number of the proposals. I think these are reflected, or these ideas are reflected in probably every proposal. And right. that while we may disagree on the proposals, we might agree on the principles. And I, I, I think that that would be powerful for us to send on as a, as a okay. task force. Well, let's, uh, so discuss. That's, that's what I'm proposing, is that we okay. do vote on these, because okay. we, we, our division may emerge on the proposals, but we might agree on some of the language. OK. So let's. to v give a very brief summary of, uh, and I'll just do one, two, and four. Um, number one is about proportionality. Um, number two is about regional self-determination, so the idea that the region is in charge of itself. <laughs> uh, and number four is about supporting Met Council members to do the job that we want them to do. So this describes how they should be paid. I noticed there was a proposal or a, a sort of a, a sub-proposal that had them not paid and more volunteer, and we expect less of them. You know, I think that's legitimate if we don't have expectations for accountability, for example, from the actual elected member, or I'm sorry, members, appointed members, elected members, whomever. So, so the idea that I'm pre pre presenting to the group is that we consider proportionality as a principle that we all agree on, that we consider regional self-determination as a principle that we all agree on, that we consider adequate pay for what we are asking council members to do as a principle that we all agree on. Okay, uh, discussion? Uh, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I would agree strongly with all of these elements. Um, uh, when I present my proposal, um, while I didn't enumerate um, these principles or findings or values, whatever you want to call them, um, uh, I, think I, I think you'll see in, in my proposal, I think you've seen a number of others, um, the, the, those present um, in, in underlying um, the recommendations. Um, it's hard to argue with fair representation. Um, I think there is an open discussion, although it seems like um, a, a lot of folks believe, both in the public testimony and in this body, um, that uh, we need an entity, this is to item two, regional self-determination, um, that has um, the ability to, to robustly advocate for what the region needs, and that's somewhat diluted um, by being uh, an agency, um, one among equals of 23 that have a statewide focus and a chief executive that has a statewide focus. And the pay thing, I think there's, that's kind of a no-brainer, low-hanging fruit. We're asking people to do a gigantic job um, and only paying them $20,000 a year, so they have to tend to their other duties and just can't climb on top of a very, very complex set of decisions that they have to make. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other, uh, other members, uh, Professor Orfield? I, I, I would just echo the comments of uh, 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 Commissioner Green and Senator Dibble. I think these are pretty self-evident propositions that we ought to make sure that everybody has a fair shake in all this. We, whatever, whoever, whether they're elected or they're some sort of a cog or whatever, it's hard to argue with that, and probably the Constitution requires it for something like this. Okay, uh, lots of hands. Um, trying to keep track of all this. Um, uh, I have Chair Cleveborn, uh, Representative Kosnick, Representative Weens, and I saw a hand down there, Ms. Beckman. Chair Cleveborn. 
So um, I think if we're looking at the proposed principles, I can agree with one, three, and four. I have a little trouble with number two. Not that I disagree with uh, the idea of local control, but um, to say that we are going to, uh, number two to me puts the cart before the horse. We haven't had a statutory change. So I would say that um, with number two, until the legislature votes on a statutory change, I would not be willing to say no statewide officials. Um, Professor Orfield, yeah, because I do believe that uh, isn't the seven county metro area in statute. The statute's pretty clear about this. Yeah. You, can, you have to be a resident of the seven county metropolitan area. You have to be yeah. a resident of your district. I mean, it is. It does create, I, I think it's a local government, but it does create a local government in the metropolitan area that is the statute, everything in the statute suggests that it is a self-determining entity already. So maybe I should ask for a point of clarification as yeah. to, because you can read this, you can read number two in many, many different Correct. ways. Yes. It's really vague. Yeah. And so um, if there's a way that we could tighten the language of number two yeah. so that I truly understand what it's saying, but as I read it, it's very broad and a little um, confusing. All right. So just to um, summarize, you're, you're comfortable with one and four. We've already done three, and you have questions on two. Okay. Um, uh, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, and I appreciate the, um, the work on this. Uh, I would oppose it, um, number two, uh, to talk about. Um, when I work with my colleagues in the legislature and try to advocate for something in the metro, there is a huge metro urban divide. And my colleagues from greater Minnesota do come down into Hennepin County, pay a lot of sales tax, other taxes, and they use services of the Met Council oftentimes to go to different events. And, and such, and so I, I don't think it's accurate uh, to say that the Met Council only provides services to metro region um, because there are citizens in other parts of the state that, um, that help pay a lot of the taxes in, in particularly Hennepin County and, and the seven county metro area. Uh, and then also, um, therefore, statewide officials should have a say and rightfully currently do on some of the stuff uh, that we vote on for um, the Met Council and their budgets. And number three, uh, just lacking legislative oversight, uh, I wouldn't be able to support uh, that as well. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, Representative Weens and then Ms. Beckman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Green. For, for starting the ball rolling on what I would consider the criteria by which we judge or we evaluate each of the courses of action or models that we propose. And uh, I like the start. I do have a little bit of an issue um, in regards to the accountability piece in the description of number two. Um, but I would also uh, like to recommend, um, and I understand this is probably more of a process question, uh, a Chair, um, that these criteria have a definition, probably pretty tight, so that we can kind of see yes, no uh, for each of the models. Um, and then from our public engagement session, I've got a couple additional ones that I could probably read into the record, the definition, but I want to go through just the common name of those, and then I'll submit the written portion of what the definition for each of those are. Um, they are accessibility, Credibility, oversight, responsibility, and uh, let's see, uh, continuity and collaboration. Um, and I, th I think today I understand as far as a process question goes, we are not voting or approving any of these. We're having a discussion on these and potentially uh, on our meeting on the 24th, we approve those particular uh, definitions or criteria by which we can evaluate each of the uh, uh, courses of action. Thank you. Um, I will thank you, Representative Weeds. Um, you know, I think we'll uh, 
probably make a couple of adjustments in terms of dates of meetings here, but um, for example, I think we had talked about a meeting, and this, this relates to process, so I, I just want to say this before I forget. We had talked about a meeting on the 30th. That's not going to work for uh, several of us, uh, so we might, will change the meeting for that week. But um, uh, I think that what we do, I, I think it's important that we do talk about these principles, um, you know, maybe before we dive into to some of the uh, proposals that have been prepared. Um, I'd like to, um, you know, continue this discussion if we can get into some of the proposals and, and you know, you, you know, at least have the those members of the task force who have prepared them present them as far as we can go today on that. Then we can have additional proposals next week, and then start to, you know, take some votes and on those and put the put those into. Uh, shape that they could be actual motions where we, we look at some of these governance models. But you know, I think that the idea of talking to about principles now is important. I, I didn't realize we had you know some additional ones today, but I want to um, you know make sure that those are adequately discussed. And um, where there is consensus, um, we should vote on them if there is significant problems or uh, ideas that uh, we are presenting to, in this case, uh, Commissioner Green, the maker of the, this, uh, or sharing these proposed principles. We can do what we did last week, where um, uh, Ms. Paddock went back, um, uh, revised her ideas, and then we, we came back. I'd rather not have us, you know, wordsmith and, uh, you know, nitpick all of these principles here, but if uh, folks could, um, you know, state their views, and you know, if there is consensus, I'm you know, so far it seems like on one and four there is some general agreement, but not everyone has spoken. Uh, so you know, where there is general agreement, I'm happy to take a vote. Um, but where there are, for example, number two, we might need to uh, to work on that a little a little bit more, and maybe even engage uh, our nonpartisan staff and. Uh, looking at the statute, getting some clarifications on on that, you know the the fa you know what what the metro means uh, statutorily, and I think Representative Kosnick raises a very valid point, um, you know, and um, uh, and so I think that uh, you know looking at maybe uh, you know a clarification on some language there would be useful as well. So that's how I would like to proceed, uh, you know, and then if you wanted to prepare something for next week around some of the ideas that you just put forward, you know, we, we will entertain that. Uh, but right now, let's uh, complete work on uh, Commissioner Green's ideas, and then we'll move on to um, hearing some ideas that uh, some of the proposals that members have prepared. With that, um, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Beckman and Commissioner Bingham, and Mr. Rockwell. So I just wanted to comment on number two. Uh, I think removing the governor from any sort of uh, role in the Met Council is not something I personally could support. There is one person who's been elected by the whole region, and that is the governor. And there is one person who is supposed to think about the region as the economic engine of the state in conjunction with the rest of the state and frankly balance the region's needs with all the rest of the state's needs. And so I, I would love if you're gonna go back and work on these things that, that number two, you know, I think is a consensus that that is one that needs more work. And, I, and that's one of the things that I've said to others on the task force, when I am looking at proposals as they come forward, uh, I am looking for a meaningful way for like the one person who is elected by the entire region to play some sort of role in the appointing, the oversight, the something. And so for that reason, I can't support number two. Thank you for that. Um, and then we're going to hear from Commissioner Bingham, uh, Mr. Rockwell, and then we might be able to possibly come to some consensus on a couple of these. But it sounds Thank like you. number two is going to need work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I um, support everything that um, Ms. Beckman said. And um, I feel the same way from a county perspective because when you look at fair representation and who um, the 
a council would be accountable to, you're also missing local government in direct elect. You completely eliminate local government when you do that. And it isn't proportional um, with the current 16 members. So it is not something that I would support. It's not something a uh, majority of the counties support at all. There was only one county that um, supported it. And so um, I also agree that if we want to be successful members of this task force, we need the governor to support something. And um, I don't know about you, but I've been around here. I haven't been around here as long as, well, I've been around here longer than some folks, but I haven't been around as some as others, looking at the guy with the great hair across from me. Um, but, you know, you, he's... <laughs> Yeah, she didn't mean me. Oh, no, I'm talking about hair. Senator Dibble. I mean, yeah, but um, I'm, I, what I'm saying is he's got to sign the bill. So if we want to be successful, we need him to sign a bill. And taking away his power is not going to do it. So I just ask people to, 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 to consider that when you're talking about fairness and represent, you know, representative um, of the region. We just spent, we're going on 90 minutes, Mr. Chair. Um, kind of going around and round and round on the same thing. And so um, I'm gonna actually try and help you out here. And I actually think we should not talk about this and we should go on and talk about the proposals, follow your lead of what you just politely asked, which is, can we send you comments, uh, the committee comments, if not wordsmith, not go back and forth here. And let's talk about the proposals so that we can come prepared next week to have another three hour meeting to get the recommendation so that we can have a good debate about the proposals ahead of us instead of you know, spending more time on um, the goals and, and the um, principles and stuff that we've already spent a lot of time last week and this week on. I think the goal today was to talk about these proposals. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Brigham. I mean, I think you know, we also want to talk about, uh, you know, have at least a, a introductory conversation about these principles that uh, Commissioner Green, a member of the task force, suggested. Um, and it would be up to her ultimately to uh, take uh, the uh, input from the task force members and maybe craft something based on that. So I'll simply say that. And um, we have um, Mr. Rockwell, and then I'll give the floor over to Commissioner Green, and she can then either ask us to vote or not, but I would prefer that we not get into the whole amendments and wordsmithing here, because uh, uh, you're, you're correct, and uh, Commissioner Bingham, we need to move on. Uh, Mr. Rockwell. Mr. Chair, thank you. Just a couple quick comments if these are getting reworked a little bit. Um, one, uh, to Ms. Beckman's idea about, about the need for those regionally elected folks. Uh, I, you know, I think the governor plays an important role on balancing the region and the state. I have talked offline with a few folks about the concept of at-large seats on the Metropolitan Council, which we haven't talked about in this room. Um, that would be another way of getting at uh, some of those concerns of having a regionally focused uh, couple of folks on the council. Um, and then also under the adequate pay uh, for the work of a Met Council member, I think that's really about pay and resources. Um, you know, it's, it's paying the council members appropriately so they have the time themselves and also as needed, you know, have staff, whether that's having like a house research type of office or whether that's having uh, legislative aid type of staff members directly for the council members. Uh, but I think that all kind of goes to that ability to do the work. It's not just about the individual person, but it's about the broader resources that they have access to. Thank you. Um, Mr. Green, do you have any closing thoughts uh, procedurally on how you'd like to uh, um, Well, thank you. Um, first of all, just thank you, everybody, so much for your input and response. I, I do want to give a special shout out to uh, Representative Kosnick. As I reread number two with your perspective, I just cracked up. I'm like, of course. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I appreciate the spirit with which that was offered, and I agree with you. Um, my sense is I am in agreement with you, Mr. Chair, that it seems as if there's consensus around one and four. And I would, I, I'm really gonna, I'm gonna re-listen to today's tape 
especially around number two. Number three, I feel like, is off the table because we already voted on um, Ms. Paddock's proposal, and that seems to address the accountability question. Um, number two, I'll continue to sort of workshop with the comments shared today. I welcome comments by email as well. Uh, but one in four, it did seem as if there's consensus around this. And I, I did want to address that I, the current council is proportional. Each person is appointed from a district that represents a, a proportional uh, section of the seven county metro. So I wasn't trying to fly in the face of that. Uh, I'm just proposing that what I read in, I think, almost all proposals, which is an interest in proportionality, just to clarify. <laughs> Okay. Um, is there anyone else that uh, would like to address any of these issues? Um, Commissioner Green, did you want, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid that if we, uh, you know, get into motions and stuff right now, it's, we're going to get a little bit bogged down. Um, do you want to, um, if anyone else has any suggestions for Commissioner Green, I, I do, did you want to move anything? I mean, I, it's your prerogative, but. I, um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move one and four. And rather than getting into the, you know, I guess I'd like to pull the audience a little bit about the language that's underneath each of those. Do you like it? Or if you don't like it, let's just stick with what's in bold. Because the idea is proportionality and adequate resource or adequate pay for the work of a council member. So I don't, I, we don't have to get into the wordsmithing. I'm happy to propose just what's in bold as the ideas. Senator Dibble, Senator Pratt. Um, I like the bolded and the not bolded language. So I would be in favor of a motion <laughs> that would go. take into account the entirety of one and four. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And we've had a lot of discussions, so I'm not sure that we have consensus around these as, as they're drafted. And I'm, I'm not comfortable voting in favor of them, um, you know, as, as we talk about, you know, fairness, um, we, we need to be looking at the region, not only as it is today, but as it's going, as it's going to be in the future, right, with, um, with the growth that we're experiencing um, in, in some of the areas. And as, as I read number four, it presumes that the Met Council is going to have the scope that it has today. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about, one of the things that I have a proposal on is, is modifying the scope of the Met Council, which will you know, potentially modify what Mr. Rockwell said or, or, or what's here. And that's, that's the concern I have. Um, I don't know, you know, if we modify the Met Council, I don't know if the time and the scope is appropriate now or not. Um, I don't think we want to short anybody, and, and I think some of it goes to who's going to be serving on that council. We haven't decided that um, because we do have statutes around how much um, folks can make, public officials can make in, in all their various capacities. So um, I, think it, I think it needs a, a, some more work, Mr. Chair, and, and I would recommend that we not take it up for a vote, but uh, that Ms. Green laid on the table for some additional work. Okay. Um, Mr. Green, I, I, uh, I want, I'm, I'm deferential to my vice chair here. Um, and um, I think you've, you know, again, there, some of these I think are, are principles that I think are similar to, uh, you know, would fall in the category of um, what Ms. Paddock brought for us, before us. But some I think do depend on, ultimately on the model that we're, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if it's okay, uh, Commissioner Green, let's um, uh, do something similar to what we did last week, which is, you know, if you want to take some of the input that uh, folks have given you, and then we can come back next week and take a look at these, if that's... Uh, Mr. Chair, that sounds fantastic. I, I tried to acknowledge, and even in my opening remarks, that number four does depend on sort of where we end up, and in a way that adequate pay for the work of a Met Council member is appropriately um, vague. <laughs> but then when we get into the language that's written here, it's less vague. Um, so I look forward to, as I said, combing over the remarks. And I welcome additional feedback, uh, including comments like, I'll never go there. 
uh, via email, that would be helpful, honestly. <laughs> We're at that time on this committee or on the task force. So um, thanks so much, and I'll come back next week. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that forward. And I think Representative Weens also has some I ideas related to principles that we'll examine next week. So um, let's see. We have, uh, I, I don't see Mayor, is Mayor Hovland online? Or? OK, so we will hear from Mayor Hovland next week. Um, Commissioner Bingham, I think you had uh, just some short yep. general ideas. Maybe we'll start with you. Yep, Mr. Chair, uh, task force members, um, we submitted, um, meaning the kitchen cabinet of the seven counties, submitted uh, what I have been very consistent and vocal about uh, over the uh, course of participating in this task force. Uh, I don't uh, know that I need to go through every uh, single point um, because they are adequately written here on this sheet and have been submitted in writing. Um, but it does state that proportional representation is our uh, top priority. We support um, a COG model, but the details of that uh, have yet to um, be in an agreement. And so therefore, a consensus around a COG is not um, uh, unanimous because of what that would look like, right? I mean, what are the weighted votes? What are, you know, what are the number of districts? So um, that there was only uh, one county that supported a direct elect member to the council. Um, that we also firmly believe that local elected officials would either need to serve on the COG or be the ones appointing those who serve on the COG. Um, we believe the chair of the COG should be determined uh, via a process that has the region supporting the person as opposed to being someone who's accountable to the governor or a state level governance, meaning some random outside person that is not uh, um, uh, uh, from the, the current COG, if that makes um, uh, sense. Um, and then, uh, again, she's going to say we do not support the status quo or the current nomination and appointment process. Um, there is obvious interest in staggered terms, but that cannot be the only uh, reform. And um, then some of the other more functions and performance issues that we were concerned about is um, transit implementation and operations should be separated from the MPO, Transportation Planning Agency. That's very important to us. Um, we also believe that counties uh, agree that the, the council needs to immediately address the funding structure and relationship between the Metro HRA, who has the housing vouchers, and the other regional HRAs that also have their housing vouchers. Some of us have our own county ones. Some of us use Metro HRA, and we believe that there is needed reform. Again, uh, there's some complexities to that. And so uh, we would ask that the um, legislature uh, and or the new council uh, be uh, have that be a top priority. And also we would like performance measures uh, related to funding for transportation and transit projects. Um, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty details, but something along the lines of what we do for the Gold Line uh, project um, that we learned what not to do from the Southwest Rail. So different things like that we would um, uh, like as far as transparency and accountability in some of those uh, projects. So again, uh, very similar to what I've been saying along uh, the lines, uh, being consistent about that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, the succinctness of it. And uh, I think that everyone has a copy, I believe. Um, uh, does anyone have any quick uh, questions or thoughts or comments on Commissioner Bingham <coughs> idea? Yeah, no, it's just a quick question. Sure, uh, you know, I've been trying to figure out the governance versus process versus funding. <laughs> so I'm adding funding to this piece. Um, one of the questions that I have been asking outside individuals is if there was adequate funding, right, for all of the housing vouchers that we need, right, if there was adequate funding for all of the transportation needs that we have, right, we heard a lot of citizens say we want more transit. If the funding was there, would the argument over governance be happening? Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, yes, um, because um, I would say that 
when, for example, with the housing voucher issue, Met Council has a levy that goes across the whole metro area, right? A portion of that levy is used for administration of the vouchers. Well, when you don't utilize Metro HRA, like Washington County, my residents, that levy is utilized towards people, uh, geographic area that is in the Metro HRA versus not. And so that is essentially taxation without representation because we are using our levies that my residents pay into for areas that, that use it and, and we don't. The other example, and I we, we had this conversation and um, the patience of both Chair Dibble and Chair Hornstein in this topic uh, is also the transit taxing districts uh, is a very similar concept where the city of Newport and other areas um, uh, throughout the metro area are taxed in a transit taxing district and we do not have transit service. And so our residents pay into it and we don't, we don't have transit service. So those are the types of things that are a governance thing um, along with a funding issue. Okay, uh, let's see. I think we had Professor Orfield and Senator Dibble. I would just like to say in terms of the housing issue that many of the county HRAs are doing a wonderful job at providing housing and uh, often uh, in the Dakota County, for example, and Carver County, they're building a two-bedroom unit for 20 or 30 percent less than they are building it in the central cities. And, and the, the Met Council has been turning down a lot of requests and, and efforts for many of the places in the, in the suburbs to build affordable housing, which would be beneficial to the region. So to that extent, I think that that's an important issue. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that, that Chair Cleavorn asked the question that she did because um, it is definitely um, a, w a way to really kind of hold up uh, and examine the issue in a particular light. Um, you know, if there were adequate funding, you know, is this really about, um, you know, totally about um, competition for resources and, and scarce resources and the like? And um, if that tension weren't present um, and all good things would flow from adequately funding, uh, the housing systems um, that are sorely needed so that people have what they need to, to work and have successful lives and get to where they need to go in terms of transportation and transit, um, would we still be having discussion around, you know, all the things that I talk, that I talk about? Accountability, clarity, transparency. Representative Weens talks about accessibility and oversight. And I think actually the answer is yes and even more so in the presence of uh, resources. Um, and, and it really comes down to a question of, of who is served and how they're served. I think Commissioner Bigham articulated that well. Um, and the uh, alternative, of course, um, absent uh, a level of accountability, which implies access by those who are served, the communities, the interests, whether those are local officials or the public, uh, means that s someone is making the decisions. Um, but what information are they using and how do they feel um, they need to account for those decisions? And, and that is a, a key and core question, whether there's a competition for resources or we're flush. Um, I think even more so when we're flush, quite, quite frankly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and then we'll give the last word to Commissioner Bingham. Thank you, and um, I hope I'm not putting water in a hornet's nest, but I will say that I um, think the example of the Southwest light rail line is an example of a governance and discussion and, and leadership d decision making versus a funding um, issue when it comes down to how some of those decisions were made, the lack of accountability, transparency um, with not only the county, um, but with um, uh, our federal partners and there were decisions made that, and there was a lot made on behalf of the region, right, without accountability and transparency. So I think that, um, I still think that the reforms, the governance change is definitely needed on top of the adequate funding because um, there are, there's still that accountability measure that, and transparency measure that lacks even um, outside of the funding side of it. Okay, well thank you. This is a, a good model for a discussion that we wanna move forward with with a number of these proposals. Um, I hope we can get to all of them. I think that 
Uh, I see some similarities between Senator Dibble and Professor Orfields. We'll, we'll try to get to those. Uh, but I wanted to get to first uh, Mary Paddock. Uh, uh, Ms. Paddock has a proposal. Um, and then um, Commissioner Green, and then we'll see if we can end with um, Senator Dibble and Senator Pratt. Um, Thank Ms. You, Paddock, Chair. did you want to present yours? Ab absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I want to. So this propo this proposes two organizations that would work together. There would be a Met Council for Metro-wide planning, coordination, and collaboration among the jurisdictions. And secondly, there would be a new organization, and that would be the Metro Transit District, and that would be a special district, which is a, a thing. Um, and it would do the planning, building, and operation of transit. And then, as you can see, I identified four kind of principles or goals in developing this the way I did. First of all, there would be accountability, both to local officials and to the public, and I would say also to the, the governor should be added in there. Uh, and this would operate with a system of checks and balances, particularly in who approves budgets and so forth, and, and also um, representation on each other's teams as they develop ideas. Uh, thirdly, it would ensure that um, the organization that builds and operates the transit would also pay for it. You recall that this was one of the recommendations of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Secondly, by dividing the function or the current operation into two units this would address competence, and each organization would do what it is best able to do, one to plan and get collaboration, and the other one to uh, do a job. Um, it would remove what many people have observed, including me, the current conflict of interest between the Met Council and um, Metro Transit. And then there's a fourth one that I didn't write down, but it's, it's really important, and it's collegiality. Collegiality is really core in this. It kind of names the problem that we're working on. How do we get everybody on board? We don't need to make binary choices here. How can we hear everybody in an orderly, functional, and productive way? So the first organization would be called the Met Council, and it would, in effect, be a council of governments. And I think, and these would be drawn from, obviously, local officials. There could be different ways of appointing those um, members of this council of government governments. In this one, I recommend that they would be appointed by the governor and you might say, well, that's no different from what we have now. But no, no, it would be different because the legislature would say to the governor, you need to have balance and equity with respect to various criteria. For example, um, the density, geographic distribution, urban, suburban, exurban areas, and whatever else would be appropriate. Um, there would be an odd number of members, staggered terms, and how about considering two non-voting members, one from MnDOT and one from Metro Transit. The board would elect a chair from among its members, there would be committees, and then um, there would be adequate resources to support um, these people, I know that the cities have said that they don't necessarily have the staffing available that counties have, and this could remedy that. And the council would be funded by the state legislature. Um, it would also be the MPO, which is, which involves the governor by definition. So the second organization would be a special district, and it would be called, for example, the Metro, Metro Transit. Its sole function would be building and operating the Metro Transit system. According to broad policy goals, 
established by the Met Council. It would have taxing authority because it would be elected and it would receive project funds like public monies from the Met Council. It would be governed by a board of directors and um, that could be chosen in a number of ways. My suggestion here is that they would be, well, they would be popularly elected. And then I'm recommending more from Hennepin County than there are from the, from the counties. And there would be one non-voting member from the Met Council and one non-voting member from MnDOT. And the chair would be elected from the board. So that's it. Um, we're going to start with uh, Representative Cleborne and then Representative Kosnick. Oh. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Representative Cleborne. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Paddock, for your uh, proposal. I'm just wondering what happens to the rest of the Met Council organization? Are you, are they, so you're separating land use completely from transportation. Is that correct? The, I'm sorry, in my plan, the Met Council would, would do all the planning that it currently does. It would do everything that it currently does except for direct, um, except for construction and operation of transit. Detailed planning, operation, and construction. Okay, I, I'm not reading your proposal that way. So, you know, um, I'm sure that there is a very thoughtful and clear plan um, that you have in mind, but I, I don't see that on this piece of paper. So please forgive me for just kind of pushing a little bit further. So we're, so in this Met Council of Governance, number one, is that that's going to continue to be the MPO. So is, is that the place where you would have parks, uh, wastewater, water? Is that what you're saying? Yes. All right, thank you very much. All, all, the, all the current functions. All right, thank you. Any other, is Representative Kosnick. Uh, Ms. Paddock, uh, you had mentioned, and I didn't see it on here, but um, I'm wearing new contacts, so my reading is a little challenging today. Um, you'd mentioned two seats for Hennepin County. Can you clarify that? I don't, I don't know if I see that in here and why. Um, okay. So you're looking at the yeah. Metro Transit section, Representative? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, could you just discuss that a little bit for me, please? So the goal here I want to present this as kind of a, a broad concept and not get weighed down in specific numbers, specific proportions. What I was trying to say is that there would be representation across all the counties, but that Hennepin County and or Minneapolis would be proportional in their representation. So for example, if everybody else, if all the counties had one representative, Hennepin would have two, for example. Does that answer your question? Uh, a little bit, I guess. Uh, I was just looking for some logic of why Hennepin County uh, would have additional people. Isn't it just based on a population? My intent is that it would be proportional to population. And if I said something to make that blurry, I apologize. Thank you. That's something to consider. I'm not sure I uh, concur with that uh, logic, but OK. Anyone else? Uh, anyone else, sorry. Senator Pratt? I'm thinking. OK. <laughs> Uh, Professor Orfield, and then we do need to move on. Uh, we'll have uh, Professor Orfield and Senator Pratt, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I, I understand that the councils need to be more accountable, and particularly with its conduct at the Southwest LRT. But I think separating the transit from land use planning 
and separating it from the MPO, in my view, is not a good thing. It's many places, we used to do this and it didn't work. Many other places do it, it doesn't work really anywhere. It only, only these separate bodies work to some degree if they have a very cooperative relationship with their MPO. The MPO decides how much money is flexed for transit. If you have a bad MPO, if you have a separate board, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any money, it doesn't have anything to do. And the most important thing is the MPO. And if the MPO allocates resources for transit, you'll have transit. If the MPO doesn't allocate resources for transit, there will be no transit. And these, these bodies that stand, I gave you a lot of literature today about studies that I've done around the country. There's lots of places that do this. It doesn't work anywhere unless you have a really good MPO that's really essentially taking very good care of the separate board. I also think it would be bad to divorce it from land use planning powers. I think that is something people dream of in other parts of the country, to have a body that can shape the density around a transit stop, that it can encourage higher density. And that council hasn't used that power very much, but it's a nice power to have, and it could really make a difference. So to divorce transit from land use planning powers, to divorce it from the MPO, I think you'd, you'd be moving us back to what we had, which there's a long history of it not working. You know, we had a separate transit agency for 25 years, and it didn't function. You know, it had all the it had it was very much like this is proposed, but it didn't work very well. So I, 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 I think that the council needs to be accountable to people. But I, I think divorcing all these pieces, I think you have less than the sum of their parts. If you can't do land use planning around transit you've really sacrificed a huge uh, uh, planning up tool. Um, we'll, we'll take Senator Pratt, uh, if, uh, Ms. Paddock has closing comments, and then we'll move on to Senator, Dibble, Senator Dibble's uh, proposal. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'm gonna bring up a comment that I made a, a little bit earlier, and that was we need a, a metropolitan body that not only represents the population as it is today, but the population that it will be. You know, we have growth in Carver, Scott, Dakota, Washington, Hennepin. Um, we have growth in all our counties, but but the rate of growth is much, much different. And I, and, and I think back to, you know, I can look just at Shakopee. We have 750 new homes going up just in Shakopee. And the population of the Metropolitan Council is going to change over time. My guess is it's going to uh, moderate. We'll never, we'll never, you know, we don't have the land that Hennepin County does, so we'll probably never have the, the population that Hennepin County does, but, but it's going to, it's going to, to even out somewhat. And, and my concern is arbitrarily setting a number on, on a county in order to say that that's proportional. We don't know that that's going to be proportional 20 years from now. And as we've seen, it takes us 30 some odd years uh, to get to reforming this thing. Um, so it's got to be able to stand the test of time. I do, uh, and, and Ms. Paddock, I, I think it's interesting about the, the transit piece. Uh, and I have a, a similar type of proposal because one of the things that I noticed as we talked to the other metropolitan areas is we are very unique. Every other metropolitan area has a monopoly on transit. And we have suburban transit providers. We have uh, MVTA, which is doing a, a, uh, a run from the Mall of America uh, through the Burnsville Transit Station out to the Shakopee Transit Station, uh, getting people to Valley Fair, Canterbury, uh, the other employers within, um, within Scott County. Because what we're finding is that a lot of the, a lot of the jobs are moving out. Right? We're seeing not only residential growth in, in, in the collar counties, but we're seeing job growth out there as well. And I don't know that building a, a, a transit model based on the hub and spoke uh, idea that, that worked back in the 60s and 70s is, is where we're going to be in the 2030s, 2040s. And having a, and so you know, even to the past, Professor, right, we had a monopoly 
on transit that we don't have today. And so I don't know that the past is a good uh, predictor of the future necessarily because we've proven that the, the STA model works. And that was because um, areas in the transit taxing district weren't being serviced and we created our own services. And we've, you know, we've merged and consolidated over time. So Shakopee Transit, Prior Lake, or we called it Laker Lines, be eventually uh, combined to become, you know, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Um, so I do think that, and, and what we've heard from locally elected officials, what we've heard from, or you know, our, our citizenship that relies on transit is that there's a belief that the operation should be separated from the Metropolitan Council. Now I'll have a little bit different take from Ms. Paddock on what that should look like, but I think it's certainly a, a good idea that, that we should seriously consider. Thank you, uh, Ms. Paddock, did you? Ms. Paddock, did you wanna make a couple of brief closing comments and we'll move on? I, we're not gonna to get to everybody. We had um, a number of uh, or everyone's proposals because we had uh, several late breaking ones, some kind of mixing up the late breaking ones and the ones we got in advance, but, um, uh, but I just wanted to give folks a head up, heads up even with the extra hour. So. If folks could keep their comments brief, um, that would be helpful. Uh, but I wanted to give Ms. Paddock the last word because this is her proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with respect to proportionality and, and uh, Hennepin County and Minneapolis, my intent in this would simply be to um, to make the representation proportional to the population, and maybe it should allow for changes in in the future. Who who knows? So I agree with uh, Senator Pratt with respect to um, um, Ms. Professor Orfield's comment. My intent in establishing the the Met Council organization would be for them to create broad broader policy, and that policy would be followed um, by Metro Transit because they would get, if you notice in my proposal, they would get their funding from the Met Council. So the Met Council would set up broad parameters about land use and transportation and how all these things fit together. And then Metro Transit would be responsible for interpreting those with more specific planning um, and construction and operations. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Paddock. And uh, uh, we'll now t uh, turn to uh, Chair Dibble's proposal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members. So um, the proposal you'll see in front of you, um, says Senator Dibble, proposal at the top is actually um, uh, a number of ideas that were blatantly stolen and plagiarized from <laughs> other people's ideas. And so it's a merger and a synthesis of a, of a number of values, priorities, ideas um, uh, that I've heard all along the way, as well as in conversations over the last week or so, as well as uh, taking a peek at other people's work um, as I was trying to pull this together over the last week, particularly over the weekend, and then late into the night last night. So this is a late breaker, so I appreciate your allowing this one to come forward uh, for discussion. I'll try to be quick um, uh, in the presentation. It's fairly straightforward. Um, uh, I think the, the values uh, and principles that underlie um, are probably self-evident, so I won't necessarily go into uh, what I'm trying to accomplish conversation um, uh, unless people uh, have questions about that and, and can ask me. So um, the, the basic idea is to create two bodies. So that would be similar to what Ms. Paddock just presented, but with some key differences, of course. There would be um, one body directly elected. So it would be kind of almost an inverse, um, not quite an inverse, but a little bit of an inverse of what uh, Ms. Paddock was talking about, um, which, we, which would be directly elected. That's what we would call the, the Civic Council. Um, and then a cog, 
a secondary body, uh, which you would call the local government council. So to the civic council, um, it would, it would it consist of 19 members, um, 16 elected to represent districts. I say it's elected, but there are actually three who, who are appointed by the governor. So this kind of gets to the conversation we had earlier um, about uh, regional perspective as well as uh, connection back to uh, the chief executive of the state. Um, and then, uh, you know, the principle of proportionality uh, for, the, for the members who are elected from districts, which would be uh, equal in size uh, according to population, um, allowing for the creation of minority opportunity districts per federal law. Terms would be staggered. Um, gubernatorial appointees would not be serving at the pleasure of the governor, but rather would be serve, served to set a term. Um, the chair would be elected uh, from the body uh, by their own, by a member of, of the of the civic council. Um, the election themselves would be nonpartisan. There would be a public finance system in place akin to what we enjoy as, as legislators. Um, all tax bonding provisions, discretionary policy decisions, et cetera, et cetera, um, originate from this entity. So that's basically another way of saying, you know, the existing responsibilities of the Met Council would stay intact. Um, the salary, you know, I don't know if this is a magic idea or not, but the idea there is to pay um, these individuals what they would, this would assume this would be a full-time job um, and it would be commensurate with um, the level of, of attention uh, and demand on folks um, in terms of the scope and scale of responsibility to that of county commissioners in the metro area. So it would be pegged to, to what county commissioners are paid uh, in the metropolitan area. Um, there would be, and this I think is an important provision, a dedicated uh, fiscal research and analysis staff, uh, as well as staff that each member has in their office, one or two people. So that would be a very similar model that we have here at the legislature. We have our nonpartisan research and, and uh, council and fiscal analyses, um, as well as we have folks within our own offices that support the work of the office. Um, and then the last point is just simply, um, you know, to make sure that folks are, are focused in accessing opportunities to learn about issues of uh, regional governance, et cetera. The local government council, this is a COG, comprised of locally elected officials. Um, two kinds of, of districts uh, would be uh, created um, and, uh, and apportioned proportionally according to population. There would be those who come from uh, county oriented district or they would be county commissioners, the other would be officials from municipalities, whether those be cities or townships. Um, there's, there's a lot of details yet to be worked out here, so I'll just acknowledge that because I was really scratching my head last night. Um, and it, you can get into a lot of very int intricate detail uh, around the selection process and the like, and that has to be worked out. And so the, to the extent that folks are Excited by this idea, I welcome a really, really robust uh, conversation to, to pin down some of these particularities uh, as we move into next week. Um, but the, basically the, the county appointees would, would be selected by counties. Um, municipal appointees would be selected by cities and townships. Um, as far as the size of this entity, this is where I struggled as well. Um, it should be at least as large as the Civic Council, the 19 members, um, and, and part of the magic there is to make sure that it's large enough that there, there really is proportionality. Um, uh, where I struggled was, was trying to peg a number and get to the proportionality that counties currently reflect in their percentage of population. You know, per uh, Senator Pratt's conversation, um, because the disparity in, in population is so great between the largest to the smallest counties in the metro, um, suddenly this, this entity is getting really, really big. Um, but uh, where I stole from Senator, or Commissioner Bigham, each county must have one seat. County district should not cross county lines. Um, as far as how to select from and make sure that we have the kind of important voice and representation that's needed, I stole from Professor Orfield, um, uh, making sure that the municipal districts have adequate voice and representation from the different kinds of 
areas around the metro area, the different kinds of cities. We have core cities, we have developed suburbs, emerging suburbs. Again, that's open for further conversation and refinement. Staggered terms, set to a term um, of service, so people can't suddenly be recalled um, if they're um, they dissatisfy um, whomever appointed them. Uh, and in terms of their power, um, there would be a requirement that this entity uh, be consulted on all policy decisions by the Civic Council, that they would um, have the power to require the Civic Council to reconsider any major policy decision. Again, this is, you'll see some similar ideas in Professor Orfield's proposal. They should have the power as well to veto the major actions of the elected body. Um, over in conversation with others, uh, an override opportunity would be afforded to the Civic Council in that instance. Uh, borrowing from Portland, um, if any new major policy power or expansion or scope of authorities and duties of the Civic Council uh, were to occur, um, that would require the ratification of the local government council. The question begs, you know, what about those that are directed by the superior authority, the legislature, and in, in a law signed by the governor? Um, this ratification uh, power reserved to the local government council wouldn't exist. Um, and then also, the uh, civic council um, would have committees, would do their policy formation in the in the process of committee work as we do in the legislature as they currently do as well. And the local government council would have an equal number of voting seats on that committee, in that committee process. Um, I, I'm not sure if the next item is legal or constitutional, but it's an acknowledgement that, uh, and, I, and I just don't know, I need to do more legal research on this, um, but um, it's an acknowledgement that a lot of folks are gonna be stepping up to a great deal more time uh, and responsibility coming off of largely volunteer city councils and the like and acknowledgement that they should be paid for that time and also that uh, they would have the opportunity again to learn more and, and become more expert in issues of regional governance. That's my proposal, Thank you very Mr. Much. Chair. Thank oh, Mr. You very Chair, much. I, I should say I'm silent on the subject of, of home rule, of developing a charter of ratification before, before the public uh, to a popular vote. I think that's an important discussion that, that we might want to have in the context of this proposal. And also when this would take effect, I would anticipate, I didn't put it down, but I would anticipate it would take effect after the conclusion of the current governor's term. Right. Thank you. Um, let's hear from um, Commissioner Bingham and Representative Weeds. Thank you. Um, first, Senator Dibble, I want to thank you because I know that this is a position that you now have evolved on because I have worked with you for, I think now it'll be six years on this topic. So I just really appreciate um, how much uh, I believe that you have taken in on this task force on this issue because this has really um, shown you really want to get, and I have had no question about it, but I just want to acknowledge that um, it shows you really want this reform for the betterment of our region and your passion, um, transit. Um, so you're really doing justice here for your people. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I, I want to thank you. I think there's a lot of good, good stuff here. I, I want to take some time to digest it. The one thing um, that I will point out regarding salaries is county commissioners, I believe all seven of us, um, make more than what we would be above um, what the governor's limit would be, so we would not be able to accept any additional compensation. I don't know if that um, weighs with anybody on that, um, it, but I think if it's going to be city folks or township folks that would be on it, that definitely uh, needs to be considered and compensated appropriately, because they make significantly less than us, especially those in Hennepin County. And so um, I uh, believe that that is a discussion that, that should play into this if this would be a route to go in. But I just want to say that um, there's uh, some, some really good things in here. And um, I look forward to um, digesting this and having some time to, to really think about um, um, how this could um, play out and 
morph into something. So thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, we'll hear from Representative Weens and then Ms. Paddock, and then we'll move on. Oh, uh, Chair Cleveland, and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, and on the topic of evolution, uh, thanks for including a uh, supermajority piece in here. I see that's a nod probably to Senator Pratt uh, <laughs> from last week. But I, I am concerned. I, I want to understand this because it's, it's interesting to me and, and my community. Um, the reason I'm here, basically, is I don't want to see any community in the metro area go through what my community is still going through um, based on the actions of the Met Council. So uh, going to your line, um, near the bottom of the page about the veto power or the two-thirds majority or supermajority. Um, and then the following line must ratify uh, a major new uh, power of expansion scope authority and duties um, by the Regional Civic Council. So if there is a community that does not agree and they have the majority of their city council or the township, uh, does that mean they can opt out of that growth plan or is that at the regional level? Chair Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Weens, I, I would say that um, if I understand the question, the short answer would be no. Um, uh, I think that what would be available to that community um, is, is to work within um, the structure of the local government council to, to argue that um, something um, needs to be different, something needs to be changed to, pers you know, if in fact the civic council has made a decision that affects that particular community um, and that community strenuously disagrees with that action, um, they could work, um, you know, and lobby the, the local government council to do one of two things. Um, uh, you know, persuade uh, the, and the, the first item would be through a simple majority vote, require the Regional Civic Council to go back through the process and reconsider that decision. The second uh, opportunity would be um, to persuade the Local Government Council to veto that action, um, you know, by, by the, by the two-thirds uh, majority. Um, of course, the Regional Civic Council, if it strenuously disagrees with that veto, could then try to mount a supermajority to over, override that veto. I would also suggest, though, that because the Regional Civic Council is going to be a broadly elected uh, entity, um, that that community would also have the opportunity to lobby within the Regional Civic Council to an entity of, of elected officials who are going to be picking up the phone, paying attention, responding um, to, to what that your community is, is saying is problematic. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I can just, uh, just to follow sure, up. Th th thank follow you. Up. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Senator Dibble. I, I think it's an improvement um, based on what we currently have, uh, and it is a process. And I think it goes to one of these criteria we're talking about, accessibility and responsiveness to communities. And so uh, thank you for your clarification. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have Ms. Paddock and then Commissioner Green. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Paddock, uh, uh, Chair Cleavorn, Commissioner Green, and then we'll move on from there. Ms. Paddock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dibble, I'm wondering if you could um, talk about this a little bit in terms of what the respective responsibilities are between the two bodies. Are you describing more of a bicameral situation or are you talking, of, like my, my proposal, for example, one group was the kind of the policy setting group and the second one was the transportation execution group. So I'm understanding yours as more of a bicameral approach to policy setting, but one of the bicameral groups would also be doing the construction and operation. Is that correct? Uh, Chair Dibble. Uh, thank you. That is a, a thank you, uh, Ms. Paddock. That is a way of thinking about it, yes. so. Um, so the Regional Civic Council would, would be the, the Metropolitan Council as we understand it today, by and large. Um, the Local Government Council, um, however, um, would be um, a consultative body. So everything that the Regional Civic Council um, uh, does uh, has to be involve uh, 
uh, collaboration with the local government council through a couple of mechanisms. I think through the local government council as a whole, um, but also uh, members of the local co uh, government council would sit uh, in equal measure on, the, on all of the committees of the regional civic council and have uh, an equal number of votes on those committees as those decisions, as those policies, as those proposals for appropriation, et cetera, come forward to the regional civic council. And then uh, the local government council would act as a, as a check on the power, if you will, of the regional civic council, almost be a quasi-judicial entity where um, the, the local government council could force a reconsideration of a decision of the civic council and, and conceivably veto a decision of the civic council um, and, uh, and, and force a, you know, a further consideration, collaboration of the perspective of locally elected officials in that form, in that format. Thank Does that you. make sense? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, we'll hear from Chair Cleveland, Commissioner Green, and then we're going to move on. Thank you. And Ms. Paddock asked one of my big questions, which one was the MPO? And then um, the question about, um, so if the local government council, the COG in this model, could um, override any taxing authority or plan or override any land use or transit plan? Well, first, I guess that's a question. They could, by supermajority vote, do that. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Dibble. Um, that's correct. Okay. So then um, the question about the MPO comes into play. And this is just a very broad question. So. Um, the federal government likes an MPO that they know that they can count on and rely on for certainty. I, I think that's some, some of the arguments that I had heard previously. If we put an, uh, this model into place, would we be in any way uh, jeopardizing the certainty that the federal government would be looking for as to who is the decider on how money that they bring into our state is spent. Chair Dibble. Um, Mr. Chair, I think the, uh, I think it'd be important to look at the current circumstance that we have, which is that um, the vast majority of, or I think pretty much all of the resource, particularly for LRT, but also arterial uh, BRT, um, uh, the, the capital funds are raised uh, and spent and controlled entirely by counties um, in, the, in the present form of governance, um, which introduces a, a certain measure of instability. In, in, uh, but we still seem to do pretty well vis-a-vis -vis the, the federal government. Um, and, and also, um, uh, you know, to the extent that, that regular uh, uh, um, uh, Collector uh, arterial, not arterial. I'm talking about freeway. You know, gold, mm -hmm. gold line BRT yeah. and et cetera, where where we rely on counties for the capital, but um, we're relying uh, on the resources mostly of the of the Met Council itself, and then occasional one-off appropriations of cash or bonding uh, for other forms of BRT. The the BRT that has letters H, B, you know, um, C, D, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Again relying on the very unreliable legislature. <laughs> so we, we already have a, a picture that's, uh, that's fairly um, uh, complex uh, with different sources of money controlled by different kinds of elected officials. So I actually think this gets us closer to uh, uh, a better collaboration, uh, better lines of accountability, better transparency. Um, added to that, um, the kind of sunshine uh, that, that I think we're in, in desperate need of. Um, where the folks who are having the discussion at tables like this uh, and making the decisions is, is much more understandable. And, and just to the, to the point of, of counties, oh, and, and something I kind of glossed over um, a little bit, um, you know, counties having um, those dollars from their own sales tax that they then send over to the Met Council for the purpose of, of paying for the capital of our major transitway systems. Um, they're at the table in a, in a really meaningful and very different way, participating in the fullness of, of those discussions. The thing I jumped over that I should get to is um, I do emphasize um, counties uh, in this particular model. I think it's a little different from what you'll see here from Senator Pratt. 
Um, the reason for that is that very reason, is because the counties are bringing um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to the table to build out our transitway system, and they have much more uh, kind of daily interaction in the conception, construction, delivery of, of the core transit services. There is, however, a need to have a strong presence of municipalities because municipalities interact and are highly exposed to the decisions of the Met Council with respect to land use. And so a slight emphasis and, and, and bias for counties in the balance of power on the local government council. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Chair, uh, I would, just, oh, I would yes. just like to Chair state Cleaver. for the record that there are pieces of this plan that I really, really like. And um, much like uh, Commissioner Bickham said, there, you, there's a lot more agreement in some of the pieces here. So I just wanted that to be on the record as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I will also echo that, uh, you know, the idea of having, you know, sort of combining two of the ideas that we've uh, explored here is, is helpful. And I think several members have done that. And I think that's really um, very, very, uh, you know, helpful as we move on and, and appreciate that. <clears throat> so I think we have time for Senator Pratt's uh, ideas. Um, we'll have to get to the next. We'll see if we can get one more in. I know we have at least one, possibly two members of the public that have signed up ahead of time to speak at our uh, public um, time, uh, which is towards the end. So um, Senator Pratt, I uh, welcome your ideas and thank you for uh, well, thank you, Mr. thought and effort into it. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and before I start, I want to thank Senator Dibble for, you know, his you know, his flexibility on on, on his proposal. Um, you know, I I think there are some things to unpack uh, as as we move forward. But what I wanted to do, members, was um, put something out there for discussion, understanding that, you know, we might tweak and modify it along the way. Um, and so. What I put forward is, is kind of it's pretty close to what we discussed uh, a week ago, um, with with a few minor changes and a, and a few uh, clarifications along the lines of of the questions that came up. Um, as I mentioned, you know, those of us in the suburbs, you know, sometimes feel uh, and and in the collar counties, you know, feel a little bit. Um, uh, overwhelmed by uh, by the by the urban and the larger counties, and and trying to find that balance that represents the, the and really provides a true regional perspective. This was uh, the outline of a of a bill that received bipartisan support uh, in the past, and um, like I say, I'm certainly open to. Uh, further suggestions and and uh, and and recommendations, but it would be seven county seats, four-year staggered terms, um, chosen chosen by uh, uh, from sitting county commissioners. Uh, Thirty-three seats proportionally allocated for cities and townships. Uh, they also would serve four-year staggered terms. Uh, selected from locally elected officials and chosen by uh, members within the district. Uh, and then for MPO purposes to address some of the concerns of, of Chair Cleborn, the Commissioner of Transportation, a non-motorized transportation rep uh, chosen by the Commissioner of Transportation, one public transit rep chosen by the Commissioner, uh, one freight transportation rep chosen by the commissioner would be involved in the MPO votes and they would also be on the council as advisory members. So as we talk about growth within the metropolitan region, um, those voices aren't lost, but we're relying on those who have already been elected by our citizens to be uh, to be at the table weighing the impact on their communities. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did, uh, and I think most members have kind of a little checklist that I, I, I put together as I was thinking about this. Senator Dibble saw me on the bonding bus yesterday banging on the computer keys rather feverishly, but 
<laughs> um, and I took some of, the, some of the concepts that we've talked about, right? And, and starting with accountability. And are we being accountable to not only our citizens, but are we being accountable to our local governments? Just as we discussed today when we talked about the, the, um, the problem statement, and my concern when we start getting to some of the directly elected, particularly if we're sticking with 16 districts, um, we're basically saying uh, a Met Council rep is going to have a constituency the size of two and a half Senate districts. And one of the reasons I believe we, we have one of the largest legislatures in the country, I know by I know we have the largest Senate in the, in the nation, and I think that was done to make sure that we were accessible to the people that we serve, and our locally elected fish, of, officials will be uh, with smaller districts, roughly the size of a Senate district would be more accessible, more accountable to the communities that they serve. Um, and this was done before I saw Senator Dibble's proposal, but structurally with an elected Met Council, there is no structural uh, uh, accountability back to local governments. Um, you know, when we talk about transparency, I think both elected and, and um, a, a, a Council of Governments model would work well. Um, when we talk about credibility, certainly both would have some credibility. Continuity, I, I actually put a question mark on the elected back council because you know one, I, I don't know that we have continuity always in the legislature for sake of our size as you know, roughly a third of our legislature I think turns over um, you know, every election cycle. Um, accessibility, Nonpartisan. Every election we have today is partisan. I'm seeing it in my communities as we start having local party units recommending and endorsing candidates for city council and school board. So to think that we could call this nonpartisan and expect it to be nonpartisan, I think uh, ignores the fact that, that it's going to happen. When I looked at the campaign finance reports for Metro Portland, we see out-of-state money, special interest money, partisan money flowing into those elections. Um, and I would want to reduce the amount of special interest money and influence on this council because um, we need this serving the residents and the communities within the metropolitan region, um, not, not the special interests. So the board would elect its own chair. The governing body of each home uh, rule charter or statutory city and town in the Metropolitan Council District would appoint a member to be on the selection committee. Um, Locally elected officials would decide amongst themselves if they had the time, the capacity, the desire to serve at that level. They would know the commitment. Um, a member would be appointed, and, and if, let's say, in Minneapolis or Bloomington or St. Paul, some of the larger cities, those representatives would be chosen by the Met Council, or, or by their city councils, I mean. Um, and the municipal committee must meet quarterly within that district to get those updates, to make sure that we've got that flow of information uh, going across, making sure that the person that they've appointed is accountable back to those uh, local communities. And that, you know, it would, these would be open meeting laws. We have eight regional bodies within the state. And this would be more similar, 
not exactly, but more similar to what we see in Duluth and Rochester and St. Cloud, Fargo, Moorhead, the others. And it's more consistent with what we've seen across the country. But really, I think it comes down to it's, it's more consistent with some of the issues that we've wanted to address as we've talked around the table um, with how we expect metropolitan governance to, to ensure um, that it's responsive to the needs of the metropolitan region. And Mr. Chair, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Senator Pratt. So let's, um, I, I have uh, Commissioner Bingham and Commissioner Green on the list so far. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Obviously, this is uh, something that I believe um, fits uh, almost everything of the county principles to a T. Um, it might be a tight fit, but it does fit. Um, the one thing that in the spirit of everything that um, we uh, have been talking about here, in, in my opinion, I think the one element that might be missing here is uh, the governor's authority in, in all of this. So the one thing that I think I would provide feedback on is um, when you're talking about the districts, um, that maybe the local districts submit up to three folks, elected, non-elected, and uh, the governor must select from those three folks, and then to have the legislature involved go through the confirmation process. So the governor would then select from that list of three, go to the Senate, so you have the legislature and the governor involved in that. Um, and I think that that is one option that I would throw out there to kind of have the governor and, and legislature still retain some, some power to retain support. Um, the one thing you brought up was continuity, and um, that is something that, that, just as you said, it popped into my head. Um, the one thing we can't do is write legislation and prepare for every situation. I think, um, you know, it's, it's case in point that um, it, just since this legislature has adjourned May 20-something of last year. You've had two resignations in the other body, Mr. Chair. Um, and so, uh, I, Senator, gosh, I did it again. I called you Mr. Chair, uh, Senator. And so um, I do think that you can't prepare for all that. And that's no different than a county or a mayor or a city council. We have resignations um, all the time as well. So um, you can't you can't prepare for all of that. So I do think the flexibility for that continuity is important. So that's what I would end on. But um, I, this is, uh, I think, a very solid proposal. I really like it. And um, I really would get behind this with, with some additional feedback and tweaks um, to ensure that um, the other elements about making sure that the governor and legislature would also be accountable in, in this, that they would have some say in accountability in this. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Green. Um, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> and um, thank you, Senator Pratt. I uh, appreciate the review. I just had a question. I thought it was interesting hearing Senator Dibble talk about in his local government council, he described why he had weighted it towards counties rather than cities in terms of the power on that council. And I would, would be interested in hearing you reflect sort of on the same thoughts and you've power, you've, uh, the balance is in reverse. And so I'd like to hear why. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for that, for that question. I don't know that it was about flipping the power, right? My motivation here, and, and, you know, I think what we heard in Scott County probably more clearly than, than some of the other listening sessions was there's a belief that our folks don't have a seat at the table. Um, you know, the, the um, and making sure that we have everyone's seat at the table, not to undermine or dilute 
the impact of the cities, but really to make sure that almost in a, almost in a bicameral way, but maybe not as formal as what Senator Dibwood proposed was to say, we have counties that have responsibilities. They take on a lot of, they have to implement what the legislature pushes out. Our counties are probably the most, as you well know, right, um, the most active forms of government that we have. There are, there truly are, are one of our most basic governments as we talk about human services, as we talk about housing and, and all the issues that uh, affect Met Council or uh, affect uh, their residents. But to get to the proportionality that you discussed earlier, um, to see that other regional bodies um, are larger and functional. My original bill, you know, much like Senator Dibble, kind of limited us to 16 districts because we were worried that if we got too big, um, it would be hard to maneuver. But what we're finding is just the opposite. Maybe we don't want to go to 58 like, like Dr. Cog and, and trying to find that happy medium, right? Not everybody gets a seat at the table, but everybody has a, everybody has a say in who's at the table representing their interests. And, you know, I, I didn't include it, but I think, you know, some of the, some of the uh, concepts in Commissioner Bingham's proposal about trying not to cross as many jurisdictional lines as possible, I think is a really good, a really good idea that's, that's not formalized here, but, but easily could be. And that's the type of feedback, the type of modifications I'm, I'm, I'm really, really open to because my goal is to make sure, and, and I think where we, where, where I land is, is our metro, we already have our citizens voting for county commissioner, for city council, for township supervisor, for um, state legislature, legislators. Um, and the work of the Met Council really in reviewing transportation, not just transit, but also the priorities for roads and bridges in the metropolitan area as well. In fact, you know, we, we were excited to get Met, <laughs> Met, Met Council just recently approved a, a, a very important project at 169 and 282 that Senator Dibble was extremely helpful in getting funded this, you know, this last session. Um, and so it goes, it goes beyond transit. Now, Mr. Chair, I would also, it's not part of this proposal, but I would, I would also just let members know, and I don't know if it's been distributed. Yeah. Um, was something along the line. I, I'd like to stay with governance right now. Um, but I do have a, an idea around, uh, met, uh, Metro transit as well, but I really want to make sure that, that those core constituencies that are most impacted by the Met Council actually have a seat at the table. And I think um, in probably a, a, a more meaningful way than, um, than a direct election would, would provide. Um, Thank you. Uh, very quickly, we have to. Yeah, on. I just, I think it wasn't more about direct elect versus not, but rather city, I don't want to say versus county, but but the balance of seven seats from the counties, 33 from cities and townships. It's that balance that I was hoping to understand better. Um, it, was really an, it was really an idea of making sure that everybody had a seat at the table, um, that we balanced the needs of the, reg of, of the county region along with the proportionality of it and making sure that we had those, those proportional seats. Um, if we were to, we don't know what, we don't know what the, the county borders aren't going to change in 50 years, but the proportional districts will. And so it's, it's more of a reflection of those two concepts, um, being that we have fixed counties and, and uh, a mobile populace. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. We're going to hear from um, 
uh, a question from or comment from Ms. Paddock and then Chair Cleavorn. Then we're going to have public testimony. And um, I believe Mr. Rockwell has a couple of ideas. Uh, we'll conclude with those, but we're not going to vote on them. We're not going to take them up, but I wanted him to at least, they're kind of similar in, in scope to uh, uh, Commissioner Green. Uh, and then we'll probably take some action once they're refined next week. So um, I would like to have uh, Ms. Paddock and then Chair Cleveborn. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pratt, just for uh, clarification, I'm wondering to what, my question is to what extent would your proposal represent the people? I mean, I, I really think it's important to set up the collaboration between the cities and the counties and so forth. How do we ensure that the people are represented? If I understand your proposal, counties and cities, not every county and city would be represented, just some, and there would be a process for selecting them. And if my particular township, for example, or county, uh, happen or city happen not to be one of those on the council. How would I, as a member of the public, have any um, um, expect any accountability from the group? Well, thank you, Ms. Paddock. I, I appreciate that question, and and it's it's a really good one. Um, the selection process is crucial to making sure that. Uh, res citizens are being represented. As I mentioned, they are, rep they are electing their city council people, they're electing their county commissioners, and those are the voices they're gonna have a seat at the table. And with the quarterly review, with the, and, and so the cities and counties, and or cities and townships would get together and they would select someone who is going to represent their collective needs and the collective needs of their citizens, right? And the, the, and, and the Met Council meetings would be completely open to the public. But just like it happens today, so many of my residents will call their city council person or they'll call their county commissioner for an issue that is within the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Council because they think that's, that's who it is. Now they, they'll know, and, and you know, in my area, if, if it, let's say it were a Spring Lake Township supervisor that got selected to the Met Council, we're a close enough region, right? These, these districts are compact enough at 33, about the size of a Senate district, where you know who that representative is going to be, and they're going to be answerable to, they're going to be living in the area, they're going to be living in close proximity. If we think about how geographically small most of our metropolitan districts are. it's I mean, we're not talking like greater Minnesota, where they represent 12 counties. Um, you know, we're talking, you know, about representatives that are represent, you know, about a third of a county in, in most cases. So um, I do believe that there's accountability back to citizens through their city councils that are helping to select their Met Council rep. Okay. Um, follow up or? Okay. Um, the last uh, comment belongs to Chair Cleavorn or question. Good, thank you. It's a one question and then a quick follow-up. Um, so the question is, where will this uh, COG get its operational funding? I'll be honest with you, Chair Cleavorn, I, I, I haven't really, I, I haven't put a lot of thought into that. Um, I, I wouldn't see that the funding would change much other than, you know, it would still be coming from property taxes. It would still be coming from uh, probably sales tax, but uh, in, the, in the transit taxing district, but um, it would be different people managing those funds. 
Okay, so the quick follow-up. So in this Certainly. model, there would be no legislative operational funding. Is that what I'm hearing? It, it Chair Cleveborn, I'm, I'm just talking about yeah. the governance and not necessarily the process right now. Okay. And so we could yeah. we could continue we we could have legislative funding. I'm trying to, to and and we can talk yeah. because I'm not quite sure how we fund the other. Yeah, I'm just curious. regional bodies. Well, no, I'm just curious because the legislature, with the exception of Senate confirmation, um, is kind of left out of this model. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I fully understand how that would happen. That's it. Okay, okay. thanks. All right, we have one last question from or short comment from Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I know the time is getting short. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Senator Pratt's, uh, I think this is something I could uh, do support and acknowledge, you know, the bill that I kind of introduced and the, kind of the concepts of strengthening the nomination process are, I see that they're involved in here and kind of taken in there. Um, I would go to uh, the kind suggestions of Commissioner um, that, uh, I'm losing my train of thought there, um, that the local counties and cities would continue to support uh, and nominate amongst themselves. A uh, little deference to the executive branch. You know, I still want the locals to select their own uh, Met Council people, uh, but perhaps the he would retain or she would retain uh, appointing the chair um, because I'm guessing that's something that would be important to them. But um, I, in, in contrast to the other uh, proposals that we heard, uh, I think it's important that, um, and maybe it's more of a philosophical thing, but my uh, value is that, you know, if we're gonna add different layers of bureaucracy, different layers of government in an effort to um, try to be more transparent, I think we actually fail. People will know who do we go to at this council, that council, this board, that board, um, but what you have here is what people currently uh, see as who they are accountable to, their cities and counties, and the relationships with the cities and counties. Uh, Commissioner Green uh, raised a good, good point, and I think the cities and counties uh, for their regional planning have a good uh, built-in uh, inert um, relationship already that of how they are proportional to each other. Mm -hmm. um, obviously there's less county commissioners, but the cities understand that for their regional planning, they work with their regional partners, which is the county commissioners. And um, you know the current funding mechanisms that the legislature has for the Met Council and the federal government, I think um, would probably fit into um, what you've got set up here. So uh, thank you for this work. and. Um, I think it answers a lot of our questions of accountability uh, better than anything we've heard so far. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. Okay, members, um, we have uh, three, uh, from what I can tell at this point, unless I'm leaving someone out, three members of the public. Uh, two are here in person. One, uh, we have a letter that uh, it's been requested to be read uh, by um, Representative Kosnick. Um, and so I will first call on Katie Jones. I see Katie here. And then after that, Michael uh, Wojcik. And is there anyone else uh, in the audience? Oh, Mr. Wiginius, okay. Um, so fasten your seatbelts, members, we're not quite done. We are gonna hear three members of the public, or four, via, three in person, one via letter. Um, Welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. Jones, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes. Hi, members of the task force. My name is Katie Jones. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'll start by saying a little bit about my background. My background's in engineering, and I'm an active member of my community in Minneapolis, particularly on uh, transportation and land use. I'm not representing any organization today, though. I have three main points I'd like to cover, representation, second, accountability, and third, authority. First, representation. There's an inherent inability of Met Council to adequately re represent the issues of the Metro because the structure in which the governor, someone with statewide interests, appoints members of the council. I'll also note the importance of proportional representation for any governance structure. Second, accountability. 
Met Council's purview is pretty narrow <laughs> compared to many other uh, government uh, structures or government uh, levels of government. Particularly, they focus on wastewater, parks, planning, and transportation. However, there's no way for the public to hold those members accountable to that particular uh, layer, uh, knowledge or expertise. But I want to compare that to other um, uh, offices that we have, including you know, the state auditor. Oftentimes, candidates for that office have a lot of financial background. And so I want us to think, you know, I, want, I would like for you all to think critically about that in particular as you think about the structure going forward for Met Council. And third, authority. First, I want to make sure to, to note how critical it is that land use and transportation be, uh, be governed at the same level um, in one body and that it's not siloed. Um, those two are inextricably linked and the results are poor if those um, are siloed in two separate bodies. Two other points regarding authority. Um, the Met Council is seemingly responsible for regional transportation, but in practice, especially when it comes to public transportation planning, the results have been piecemeal and disjointed. Every LRT project has been planned by a county. The Orange Line BRT was a result of city advocacy. Um, and I'm in favor of those projects, but think they would be more appropriate for projects with such regional impact to be spearheaded by the Met Council. And I'm not saying that the Met Council should necessarily be the builders of those projects, but I do think they should have more authority and resources in efficiently planning them. A second piece here is on comp planning processes. Uh, the Met Council only has carrots for compliance. Those are good and they work for 95% of communities, but if the state wants communities to follow state laws for regional planning, there should be consequences for not doing so. The Met Council needs tools beyond carrots to be able to carry out its regional planning authority, whether it's fines, withholding eligibility for transportation, or other ideas. I bring these up in the context of this governance conversation because whatever the governance council structure is, they need the appropriate tools to carry out their statutory activities. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony for coming out to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have Michael uh, Wojcik. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Hi there, my name is Michael Wojak. I understand that um, not everyone has the um, Iron Range background, so the pronunciation can sometimes be difficult. Um, I, am, uh, I am currently the Executive Director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, but I also have experience um, with, a, uh, with a COG in Greater Minnesota. I actually served on the Rochester Olmsted Council of Governments for about 10 years. I served on the City Council in the City of Rochester for 12 years, and um, I. I, I want to come here with a cautionary tale because there were a lot of um, things that I experienced being on that uh, COG and actual data and the outcomes that show that um, COGs can perform very poorly and um, any attempt to go down that road should be met with some amount of skepticism and appropriate precautions in place. There's, I've learned a lot today sitting here listening to um, you folks talk, it makes me yearn for those city council days. <laughs> Not really, Not so but <laughs> I did learn from you though. Um, but I wanted to focus on, on a few things and that um, I, I think there's an idea that when you put everyone in the room that everyone suddenly agrees and um, that's the way it's going to be. And I actually look at the uh, Met Council um, despite some fairly obvious flaws with somewhat ad admiration. And I compare the, uh, the outcomes of the Twin Cities metropolitan area to other metros around the, county, around the country. And there are a lot of things that are being done better here than in other places. But I think you're right to um, look at a refresh and try and uh, see what's going to work better going forward. Um, the, the Southwest Light Rail Line, I think everyone in Minnesota has a great deal of frustration with that, and I think that's why, um, you know, a big part of why we are all here. But COGS don't necessarily uh, perform in a, um, in a better way, and what I would say is the first issue with COGS is that the makeup rarely represents the actual um, population, and, um, you know, some of the models that we see and what we struggle with in the city of Rochester is, you know, we 
Um, when you start giving uh, votes to individual levels of government, despite the size, you can have two townships representing 25 people that all vote one city, um, representing 125,000. We can contort ourselves in all sorts of ways to avoid direct democracy and um, fair representation, but I think we ought not to be doing that. I think that um, Senator Bratt brings up a very good point about, you know, demographics are changing, population centers are changing, and but when you have um, population guidance that gets updated, that changes with it, and that's an important uh, part of democracy. With ACOG, you don't have that. We have a contract from, I think, probably before I was born, that kind of stipulates who's on there, and as a result, we have a um, regional government that looks nothing like the city of Rochester and looks nothing like 90% of the population of the Olmstead County area. Some of the things that we see with that is that um, overlapping governments sometimes get disproportionate representation. I believe that um, many times we've had more township officers on our COG than we have had um, uh, residents of the city. Um, there is nothing in law that prevents uh, counties from gerrymandering and how they draw up their districts. Um, there's a lot of people are surprised to know that um, the county lines in Rochester cross our city boundaries five or six times. And the reason for that is it allows for there to be less seats within the city of Rochester. So anytime you're looking at one level of government to promote another, you should do so with a great deal of caution. Um, there is. Once you actually get into these situations, I know there's this belief that you have these local elected officials, and I love them, I was one, they're all awesome, but the reality is, is their focus is um, first and foremost on the level of government that they're serving. This is a big, really important kind of issue, and I think it's something that needs to be the primary focus, and um, I would be very concerned about even myself serving in that capacity on a COG. My primary focus was always with the city itself, so I would be concerned about that as well. Um, and then I think there's also a hierarchy depending on how you set up a COG. And I think every COG, you know, if, if there's eight COGs in Minnesota, there's probably 10 different models for doing it. And the, <laughs> the issue is going to be that any, any way you set it up, there's going to be some primary government influence dealing with the staffing. And that's always going to bend um, towards that desired outcome. So I don't think COGs are a uh, bulletproof solution. Having been on one myself, I see a lot of concerns with them. I would encourage folks to look seriously at some of the um, potential negative outcomes. And I want to talk now about um, what when you have when you don't mix land use and transportation and it's so incredibly important to do those things together what can happen and here are some statistics from the uh, from the city of rochester since 1980 our population has grown 111 percent we're a fast growing city we've got a nice hospital there we all know that um, our geography has grown 208 percent and it's important to realize the city of Rochester now is geographically bigger than the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul. And when it comes to taxpayers footing the bill for that, that is a huge problem. Not only that, but our roads, our miles of road has grown by 255%. It's even worse than that. This was actually, most of this happened between 1980 and 2008. The city has done great steps to improve their performance since then. However, the COG has not. And we're seeing some pretty ridiculous projects coming out of that. And what I would point to is there is an interchange that's been approved by the, um, co the county, the COG, and MnDOT that's just outside of Rochester using corridors of commerce money. They came in looking for state bonding and pretty much got laughed out of the idea of building this interchange in a place there's no safety concerns at present, and the city properly identified in its comprehensive plan update that there was no ability for growth in this region for 50 years. It was so undevelopable that the power utility bought land to put up solar arrays, because that's all you could do on that land. This interchange, where there's no safety concerns, is going to get an 80 to $90 million interchange, because that's what came out of the COG. That's absurd. And at the same time this interchange is being done, there's much more dangerous interchanges in Rochester and Byron and Casson along that same stretch that are being completely ignored. So the idea that a COG is going to be a magical solution, I would encourage you to take a look at what the actual outcomes have been and figure out a way to do this so that the folks who are part of this committee do have that regional perspective. It is important that the folks that Senator Dibble represent and the folks that Senator Pratt represent feel part of this process and are able to get what they need to make their, um, their places successful. I'm getting the music, so I yeah. to <laughs> totally appreciate that. Yeah. Um, in, in closing, what I would say is that um, 
having lived with COGS many years, um, when I heard COG was part of the co conversation, I said, well, I got a few thoughts on this and I'll maybe share them. And don't worry if you want to ignore everything I said, I've got two teenage daughters so I can handle it. Okay, thank you. Thank you much. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, thank you very much for your perspective. And uh, we did have a little bit of an overview from about the Greater Minnesota COGS, but you, you certainly gave us some additional perspective. We're going to hear from Mr. Wagenius and then uh, a letter from uh, Denise Peterson. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Peter Wagenius. Less than a decade ago, there was a push to reform the Met Council, not as large as today. It sadly fizzled out, and I'd like to share part of the reason why. I was working for the mayor of Minneapolis, the second mayor in a row, to publicly and clearly express strong dissatisfaction with the Met Council. This attracted the attention of reform-minded legislators of both parties who know what you know today, that redesignation of an MPO required approval from the largest city in the region. The mayor and I met with multiple legislators, including those seeking a bipartisan alliance, which was indeed a possibility. Long story short, the mayor would tell people, yes, we really need reform. But no matter how unhappy we were with the Met Council, any alternative must be based on one person, one vote. For example, we could not support any proposal in which residents of Hennepin County would become one twelfth of a person compared with residents of another county. And Ramsey County would likewise insist their residents were not one fifth of a person. It seems that folks hadn't really done the math before, and unfortunately, we later learned that the one twelfth proposal had been amended to make Hennepin residents one sixth of a person as if we would negotiate away the equality of our constituents by different fractions. I would love to just persuade you that the Supreme Court was correct in Reynolds v. Sims, and that should guide us here. I would love for you to read the Brookings Report called An Inherent Bias, Geographic and Racial Ethnic Patterns of Metropolitan Planning Organization Boards by Professor Thomas Sanchez, which shows real-world impacts of underrepresentation. But if I can't persuade all of you Let's just talk politically reality. Even if all of you don't think one person, one vote should apply to metro governance, the principle is already used to redistrict the legislature, which means Hennepin and Ramsey have exactly as many votes as their populations warrant. I counted this morning, 45 legislators live in Hennepin County, not including Rockford and Hanover. Another 25 represent significant portions of Ramsey. Of the total, 75, 70 are in the majority. So there is 0% chance that a proposal which underrepresents Hennepin and Ramsey resident is going to sneak into law unnoticed. That would be true even if the House Speaker, Senate President, and both majority leaders were not residents of Hennepin County. Senator Pratt is absolutely correct about partisanship being pervasive. And so I could prefer the current system as a Democrat since my candidate for governor won the last four elections. On a partisan basis, I'm overrepresented. But I shouldn't be. My candidate won the election for governor with 64% of the metro area vote, but gets to make 100% of the appointments, it's not healthy. We need a system where every metro voter is represented all the time, not 64% represented and the rest not at all. Every metro voter, everywhere, all at once, equally, just like in the legislature or on any county board. In conclusion, please, please recognize that there is no other path to reform. We could end up with nothing again. Over 70 legislators are not going to demote their own constituents to second class citizens of the Metro. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Beginius. Um, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair and task members. Uh, I'm gonna, I was asked to uh, read this letter on behalf of a constituent, and so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, it is in your packet, and uh, this constituent was at um, the Shakopee meeting um, that wasn't prepared to formalize her comments but so this is from, from Denise Peterson in Credit River uh, she would like to provide a personal perspective of our governance changes to the Met Council in the summer of 2022 our quiet neighborhood in rural Credit River learned of a concept plan for an 86 acre development that was being considered for multiple reasons many in our community were alarmed and feared losing their idyllic idyllic surroundings to this development uh, we live less than a mile away from a 2,785 acre park reserve. There are farm fields, wetlands, a remnant of the big woods, abundant wildlife, and homestead properties around us ranging from two and a half to 40 acres. 
This can best, best be described as rural residential and literally a slice of heaven. The aforementioned afore reasons account for why our citizens moved to Credit River and desired to protect it from dense population expansion. Many of us banded together as a group concern of concerned citizens. We actively attended city council meetings, city planning meetings, surveyed our residents, hosted neighborhood meetings, hosted our own citizen-led citywide meeting, sent emails, and a few from our group even met with a Met Council representative that is knowledgeable about all things sewer. Our goal was not to stop the development from occurring, but to ensure that the citizens had a say in the density of their city. Through conversations with the city council, uh, they were we were informed that the Met Council and the comprehensive plan had already determined the number of flushes necessary. The Met Council said that we can work with our city council to reach an agreement. The city council said we can work with the Met Council. There seems to be a lack of accountability and transparency here. When active and engaged citizens are stepping up and standing up only to learn that all avenues to an alternative plan seem to be thwarted, then I say, Houston, we have a problem. Our forefathers designed our government to operate from the bottom up, not the top down, government of, by, and for the people. I suggest a reduction in scope, power, and reach of the Met Council, a downsizing. The Met Council in its present form is no longer functioning as it was intended. Outside of the boundaries of Minneapolis and St. Paul, the needs and desires of citizens are quite different and should be addressed locally by the officials they elect. Cities should be allowed to grow as their citizens desire for their communities. We should not be mandated to provide three to five homes and a one acre plot to meet Met Council requirements. The market and the citizens of the community should determine this in concert with their elected officials. I am in favor of a council of governments selecting candidates from their own districts who were already elected and are willing to serve. Alternatively, or in addition to, I suggest candidates who are chosen through a submittal of qualified applicants that reside in that district and are chosen by the local units of government. Or as another alternative, if the task force is unable to agree upon a change model, I may suggest a weighted voting system that grants an extra vote for each voting member in the district being impacted by their decision. The Met Council wields far too much power and control with no real oversight and needs to be reined in. It is my hope that the task force will put forth meaningful changes to the legislature for a new and improved governance structure to the Met Council. Thank you for your time and consideration and for the opportunity to provide input on the governance changes for the Met Council. Denise Peterson. Thank you for reading that, um, Representative Kozlik. And I also want to call your attention in the packet we have several other uh, written, written testimony, Ted uh, Coldery. Um, we have one from the Minnesota Inter-County Association, uh, one from Global Leadership Benchmarking Associates, uh, and the city of Minneapolis. I might have left out one or two, but we have those in your packets. Uh, so please read those members. Um, and before we break, I just wanted to, I don't know if we we're going to have time uh, to go over your uh, ideas, but I wanted to call attention to Mr. Rockwell's um, recommended motions. These are similar to what um, Commissioner Green brought to us earlier today. Um, and so I, I think you know, we can, uh, we can maybe streamline these for next time, uh, and then we'll, we'll take them up next time. Uh, and some are somewhat contingent. I know that one is contingent on, uh, you know, a particular model, uh, gubernatorial, if it remains gubernatorial bounty. So maybe ones that are, are not necessarily, uh, and then you have also some um, uh, resources for the um, uh, task force to, uh, to look at, but maybe if you just for a minute or two want to highlight uh, some a couple of things that you would like the task force to look at in the next week. Mr. Chair, absolutely. Uh, uh, so there's three different c concepts in there. One is very reminiscent of uh, what is in Senator Dibble's and Commissioner Green's uh, uh, frameworks, which is that uh, we need to be paying and providing resources to our council members proportional to their responsibilities, right? Whether they're, if their responsibilities are what they are today, they should be paid full time, have staff, have resources, uh, or 
if we don't want to pay them uh, that, then we should downsize their responsibilities, make more of uh, kind of a corporate uh, structure or something like the Board of Regents. We have a stronger executive and a more advisory board with select powers. Uh, the second uh, is a reflection on this concept of accountability and, uh, and the idea that there are accountable, there are bodies that are appointed by governors in the United States where there is more accountability. And it's uh, uh, a, a result of, uh, of a number of factors, but, but one of the factors is just public awareness that they are accountable to the government. Uh, you know, I worked for a New York City council member. Uh, the New York City uh, MTA uh, board is appointed by the governor. And when the MTA is going awry, the governor feels an extraordinary amount of political heat. Uh, now, part of that is the size of the Metropolitan uh, Transit Authority in New York City. Uh, and part of that is just a public awareness that the board is, in fact, the governor's creature. Uh, and so that is a little bit of a, a nod to if we cannot come to a broader governance shift, uh, there may be things that we can do to actually put the responsibility more squarely at the governor's feet uh, uh, so that the council is more effectively advocating for the priorities of the region. The last uh, is, you know, I think a little bit of a reflection on, the, on how much time we spent talking about what this task force should be doing. What are the principles that we are trying to further? We had a lot of conversation at the last meeting, almost half of this meeting, about you know, how to define accountability. Uh, what we haven't really talked about is what is the Metropolitan Council trying to accomplish? When we look at the Metropolitan Council's mission, it is this, uh, you know, this very streamlined uh, uh, economic and regional growth goal. But when we look actually at Dr. Cog, at MnDOT, at other bodies, there's a much broader set of goals, right? Vibrant communities, protecting the national environment, economic competitiveness, uh, climate security, and so on and so forth. And so if we want to have the Metropolitan Council have vision, uh, I think we need to actually articulate what we want that vision to accomplish. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take a look at some of those ideas next week. So members, thank you for a very productive uh, and engaging um, meeting today. Uh, and we're, we're going to hear from Professor Orfield next week. His um, uh, proposal is uh, pretty similar to uh, Senator Dibbles, but you know. I think, I think that uh, I can. We don't have to talk about mine. It's similar enough. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, and then we'll hear from Commissioner Green and uh, Mayor Hovland, who's not here. And that will conclude uh, the proposals that we receive from members. Uh, we'll continue uh, a conversation on, on principles. I don't want it to go on as long necessarily today, uh, uh, next week, as it did today. So I would ask, um, uh, you know, again, um, folks who have uh, input uh, for uh, Commissioner Green and um, Mr. Rockwell to give that to them so that we can kind of move through that piece of the agenda uh, in, in good time. And then, uh, then we'll start to take up some, uh, uh, you know, some motions around uh, governance and, and uh, drill deeper into what we heard today. But I'd ask some of the authors of your uh, ideas to, again, maybe put them in, in resolution form, streamline them, uh, so that we can then vote, amend, uh, as necessary. And of course, that might need to go into the following week. Um, and we're going to have a different date. I think we've thrown out January 30th. That's not going to work. Uh, but we may. So keep, keep uh, attend, if you get a Taylor uh, Kohler uh, email, about date for next meeting, please uh, open that so that you'll know exactly when we're meeting and the time. Uh, Senator Dibble. And maybe you said this, and my mind was wondering, 9 o'clock next week? Yes, 9 o'clock next week. Uh, and again, um, we'll uh, have a similar, um, similar uh, conversation as we had today, but with um, really voting on some, some proposals and uh, those of, who have uh, put forward ideas again, if you could put those in uh, succinct resolution type format. Um, again, these are recommendations, they're not bills. I think someone said that today, I think it was Senator Pratt. Um, I really appreciated that. Um, again, 
that's for uh, to be incorporated into the final report. So with that, members, thank you again for coming an hour early, staying a few minutes later, and for all of your contributions today. We are adjourned.